Greetings everyone and welcome to another episode of Anime Recaps. Today we will do a speedrun on the whole JoJo's Bizarre Adventure series, going from part 1 to part 6. As always I will do my best to recap everything in detail and if you guys wish to support me, then you will find my merch store as well as my Ko-Fi page in the description. With that out the way, I hope you enjoy this video, and let's jump straight into the recap. The story start in 1880 England, with Jonathan Joestar who's a young man with the intent to become a gentleman, such as fighting for a woman's honor even if he would not win. Meanwhile, the thief Dario Brando is on his deathbed and tells his son Deo to move in with the Joestar family to fulfill his own life debt to the Joestars, and the latter does so, intending to take the Joestar fortune for himself. Deo outshines Jonathan while making him a pariah among his family and friends then takes the first kiss from Jonathan's childhood love Irina Pendleton and makes her unable to look Jonathan in the eye. Upon learning of Deo's action, Jonathan goes into a rage and hits him which causes some of Deo's blood to be spilled on an ancient stone mask that seems to react, until the fight is broken up by George. But later that time, Deo has Jonathan's beloved dog Danny killed by putting him in the incinerator. In 1888, George becomes ill and bedridden, and while doing research on the strange mask, Jonathan finds the dying Dario's letter and finds his symptoms are the same as George's. Using Deo's pride against him, Jonathan deduces that Deo murdered Dario and intends to do the same with George. After leaving instructions for only trusted doctors to tend to his father, Jonathan sets off to London to discover the origins of the poison, and fearing that Jonathan would ruin his plans, Deo steals the stone mask with the intent to arrange an accidental death with it. In London's Ogre Street, Jonathan is attacked by the thug Robert Speedwagon, but his sense of honor and desire to save his father convinces Speedwagon to assist in the search for an oriental druggist. Meanwhile, assuming that Jonathan died in Ogre Street, Dale crosses paths with two drunkards and slits one of them to subject the other to an activated stone mask. Instead of killing the second drunkard like Dale thought it would, the mask turns the victim into a powerful vampire that nearly kills him, but Dale is saved when the sun rises and the sunlight turns the vampire to dust. At the Joestar mansion, Jonathan returns with an antidote for George and intends to turn Dale into the police, until Speedwagon arrives to tell Jonathan that Dao is evil by birth and brings the druggist Wang Chan who sold Dao the poison. Evading arrest, Dao kills George and uses the mask on himself to become an immortal vampire. As several attempts to kill him fail, Jonathan sets the mansion on fire and leads Dao to the roof so Speedwagon can escape. Jonathan then attempts to sacrifice himself by dragging Dao down to a fiery death, but Dale counters forces him to use the layout to safely land while impaling Dale on the statue of Joestar family's guardian angel. Speedwagon pulls Jonathan to safety while Dale survives by draining Chan of his blood after the latter attempted to grab the mask from among the debris. In the hospital, Jonathan rekindles his friendship with Irina before a man called Will Zeppeli heals his broken arm with a supernatural technique called Hammond. Meanwhile, Dale continues to prowl London, recruiting the vilest men he knows into his undead army, including Jack the Ripper. As Zeppeli trains Jonathan to master Hammond, which kills vampires, he explains how he has dedicated himself to mastering it in order to destroy the mask. Jonathan, Speedwagon, and Zeppeli travel to the town of Wind Knight's Lot, where people have gone missing, and whilst passing through a tunnel into the town, they are attacked by Jack. As he tries to lure them into a trap, Jonathan is tasked by Zeppeli to finish him off without spilling any of the wine he has poured into a glass. Using the wine, Jonathan comes to understand Hammond, allowing him to kill Jack from the other side of a wall using his own technique, Overdrive. In Wind Knight's Lot, a pickpocket boy called Poco, hypnotized by Dio, lures Jonathan and the group to the graveyard where they are attacked by Dio's legion of zombies. Zeppeli attempts to use his Hammond attacks on Dio, but he counters by freezing his veins, and after also freezing Jonathan's hand, Deo summons two powerful zombie knights, Tarkus and Bruford to finish the job for him. As Jonathan struggles against them, Speedwagon uses his body heat to thaw Zeppeli's arm while Jonathan and Bruford's fight moves into the depths of a nearby lake. Jonathan dives deeper into the lake and Bruford follows, until he finds an air pocket under a rock and uses this breath of air to launch a turquoise blue overdrive attack at him. Bruford barely avoids Jonathan's attack and ensnares Jonathan with his hair. However, 
Jonathan blocks his attack and channels an overdrive through his sword, disintegrating one of his arms, before unleashing a barrage against him. As Bruford dies, he regains his human soul and leaves Jonathan his sword. Tarkus then attacks, but Jonathan and Zeppeli get Speedwagon and Poco to safety using Hammond to form a bunch of leaves as a hang glider. As Tarkus leaps after them, they touch down at a knight's training ground to stand against him. Jonathan is pulled inside the grounds by Tarkus, thrusting him into a chain-neck deathmatch, in which one must decapitate the other in order to free himself. Realizing Jonathan will be killed if no one does anything, Poco overcomes his nerves and enters the grounds via a window before he unlocks the door so Zeppeli can get inside. Zeppeli recalls how his Hammond teacher Tunpetti foretold his death would take place in the very place he is in right now, and knowing this. He fights against Tarkus with the intention of finding a way to free Jonathan, however, Tarkus ensnares Zeppeli with a chain and rips his body into two. Using the last of his strength, Zeppeli transfers the last of his Hammond energy to Jonathan who heals his injuries, breaks free from his chains, and obliterates Tarkus. Following the battle, Zeppeli tells Jonathan that he has accepted his fate and has passed his will onto him before passing away. As Jonathan, Speedwagon, and Poco make their way back to Wind Knight's lot, they meet Tunpetti, along with his other students, Dyer and Strizo. Meanwhile, Poco's sister has been kidnapped by Dio, who sends a zombie named Doobie to attack Poco's sister after she refuses to join his legion. But Jonathan and the others arrive in time to save her. Doobie delivers a few bites on Jonathan with the poisonous snakes in his head, but neither the venom nor Doobie stands up to Jonathan's power. As Poco and his sister reunite, Dyer launches the ultimate attack the Thundercross split on Dio, but he is caught by his freezing ability and is shattered into pieces. Jonathan slices his sword straight through Dio's body, but he freezes his sword too and attacks Jonathan's neck. However, the latter thaws himself by heating the sword with a torch and sets his fists on fire to counter the freezing and breaks through Dio's defenses with an overdrive attack. As his body melts and he falls into the abyss, Dio launches a final attack that pierces Jonathan's hand before he decapitates his head to survive the Hammond attack. After the battle is over, Speedwagon destroys the stone mask with a hammer and Jonathan marries Irina, before they depart on a ship to America to go on their honeymoon. Dao and the zombified Wang Chen sneak aboard and on February 7, 1889, Dao fatally injures Jonathan as he intends to take his body to use as his own. Most of the ship becomes zombies after Chan infects one passenger and using the last Hammond energy he has. Jonathan decapitates Chan and compels his body to obstruct the ship's paddle wheel setting it to explode. As Irina resolves to die by her husband's side, Jonathan instead tells her to live on and protect the baby whose mother died during the zombie attack. Jonathan passes away with Deo's head in his arms as Irina and the baby hide in his bombproof coffin to protect them from the explosion. Irina is rescued near the Canary Islands, and vows to pass on the truth of what happened to the unborn child she conceived with Jonathan and generations to follow. Sometime in the future, Robert Speedwagon has become a wealthy oil tycoon and in 1938, his expedition crew uncovers a tomb in Mexico filled with stone masks and a petrified yet living body embedded in a stone pillar. Strizo, obsessed with immortality, kills Speedwagon's archaeological team and uses some of the wounded Speedwagon's blood to activate a stone mask. Joseph Joe Starr, Jonathan and Irina's grandson, has recently moved to New York from England with Irina. Joseph uses his Hammond to save a young pickpocket named Smokey Brown from some crooked cops before the kid is then taken in by Irina. Joseph is later confronted by a rejuvenated Strizo who has come to kill him before his abilities become more powerful, but Joseph makes the first move with a surprise Tommy gun attack after being informed of Speedwagon's death prior to this. Strizo recovers from Joseph's attack and uses the same laser eye attack that Dea used on Jonathan to seemingly pierce through Joseph's head and neck. However, Joseph tricks him into attacking a mirror reflection and flees to the Brooklyn Bridge. Strizo catches up and once again attacks him with his laser, but Joseph reflects it back at him with a Hammond glass before striking him with. He then reveals that the Pillar Man in Mexico has been feeding off the blood he spilled and is about to wake from a 2,000-year slumber before he kills himself with Hammond stored in his body. Meanwhile in Mexico, a German military general named Rudolf von Stroheim, 
searching for ways to enhance the German military effort interrogates a still-living speedwagon about the Pillar Man which Stroheim intends to revive. Joseph makes his way to Mexico concerned about the Pillar Man, unaware that he is being followed by a strange man. He is then confronted in the desert by Donovan, one of Stroheim's assassins, but subdues him and learns that Speedwagon is still alive. Meanwhile, Stroheim awakens the Pillar Man, dubbed as Santana, by sacrificing several prisoners to flood the figure with blood. To test Santana, Stroheim sends in a prisoner that was made into a vampire by a stone mask but he absorbs the vampire into his body to feed himself before uttering Stroheim's name. He escapes into an air vent which he then uses to enter the observation chamber and confront Stroheim over being prematurely awakened, entering the body of a dead soldier which he then uses to kill the other soldiers by mimicking their gunfire. At that moment, Joseph who sneaked into the base, uses his hammond to shield everyone with some of Stroheim's hair. He initially refuses to fight Santana and explains he is only in Mexico to bring Speedwagon back to America but Santana attacks Joseph when he finds him annoying, causing the latter to hit back as his Hammond and Santana's skin makes both Joseph's Hammond and Santana's absorbing ability ineffective. Joseph feigns being unconscious to use his Hammond within Santana's body to rip him in half and attempts to drag his torso into the sunlight to petrify him, only to be immobilized by Santana's flesh before he can reach the exit. Stroheim tries to open the door by himself, but Santana ensnares his leg, and Joseph chops it off, allowing him to open the door and expose Santana to the sunlight. He then dives into Stroheim's body through his wound and manipulates his body in an attempt to hide in the well, but Stroheim informs Joseph of other pillar men the Wehrmacht discovered in Europe. After telling Joseph to meet someone Speedwagon knows in Rome, Stroheim explodes a grenade on himself in an attempt to destroy Santana who in attacks until Joseph uses the noon sunlight reflected in the well's water to turn him to stone. Speedwagon takes Santana to the Speedwagon Foundation in Washington DC as Santana is still alive, but Speedwagon scientists keep him dormant by the use of ultraviolet light. In Rome, Joseph and Speedwagon meet Will Zeppeli's grandson, Caesar and both men express a dislike towards each other as they test each other's Hammond abilities. Caesar then makes arrangements for Joseph and Speedwagon to be taken to the Colosseum where the Pillar Men are being kept. One of the Pillar Men, Wamu, breaks free, killing a group of German soldiers and awakening his masters, Kars and Asidisai. As they leave, Wamu accidentally bumps into Caesar's friend Mark, destroying half of his body leaving Caesar forced to use his Hammond to peacefully end Mark's suffering and vows vengeance against the Pillar Men. He then engages Wamu in battle but Wamu counters Caesar's Hammond bubble launcher using the wires on his headgear to unleash a wind that pops all of the bubbles, leaving Caesar temporarily blind in one eye. As Kars and Asidisai head to the surface, Wamu fights Joseph, slicing through his wrist to make the battle last only a minute. Joseph lands a hit on Wamu with his clacker boomerang, but the latter counters with his divine sandstorm technique leaving him barely alive. Joseph pretends to run away and tricks Wamu onto a mine cart ride through the ruin and he knocks Joseph off the cart, but not before he proclaims that as the first person to harm Wamu, and he would be strong enough to beat him in a month's time. Intrigued, Wamu lets Joseph go, but implants a wedding ring around his aorta that will release a deadly poison in 33 days' time, with the antidote held in his lip piercing. Acidicide then implants another poison-filled ring around Joseph's windpipe, with the antidote contained in his nose piercing, and the pillar men leave in search of the red stone of Aya. Caesar realizes Joseph's resolve and promises to aid him to control his Hammond, before he takes him to Venice to meet his Hammond coach Lisa Lisa. She orders Joseph to wear a mask that limits his breathing for the duration of his training to better focus his Hammond. Lisa Lisa then tasks Joseph and Caesar to the nearby air Suplina Island to climb the 24-meter hell pillar covered in oil and they can only climb it using Hammond. Observing Caesar's efforts, Joseph learns to climb up by focusing Hammond energy into just his fingertips and as the days pass, he assumes a crack in the pillar is an easy break, but this turns out to be a trap, causing the pillar to start spewing oil out at high pressure at its 20-meter mark. Caesar passes through by using Hammond energy to simultaneously grip the pillar with his feet and repel the barrier, eventually reaching the peak. Joseph gets passed by traveling across the oil barrier to its weakest point so he can leap over it, but as he runs out of breath at the last meter, Caesar helps him up. 
Lisa Lisa explains that Kars is seeking a perfectly cut red stone of Aya possessed by Lisa Lisa known as the Super Aya to power the stone mask created by Kars to become the ultimate life form. Joseph says they should destroy the stone, but Lisa Lisa reveals that according to legend only it can defeat the Pillar Man. With a week left until the poisonous rings inside Joseph kill him, Lisa Lisa pits him and Caesar against Hammond instructors Loggins and Messina, respectively for their final lesson. However, Joseph finds Acidesai has killed Loggins and in anger he confronts him over a bed of spikes. Thanks to an intricate trap, Joseph uses a wire set up on Loggins to sever Acidesai's arm, however, the latter repairs himself with Loggins before attacking with the Burning King's prison, an ability to control the temperature of his burning blood. Joseph ensnares Acidesai in Hammond Conductive Wool using sleight of hand and destroys him with an overdrive attack. After the battle, Joseph takes the antidote for the poisonous ring around his windpipe, leaving six days left until Wamu's poisonous ring dissolves. He heads back to the castle, unaware that Acidesai's nervous system is clinging onto his back and as Joseph waits to warn Lisa Lisa about the Pillar Men, Acidesai's nervous system takes over the body of Lisa Lisa's assistant Susie Q, and sends the Super Aya off on a boat bound for Venice. Before Joseph and Caesar can pursue the boat, Acidesai stands in their way, knowing full well they cannot kill him without killing Susie Q as well. As Acidesai boils her blood to kill everyone in the room, Joseph and Caesar combine their hammon in opposing forces, forcing Acidesai's nervous system to safely release Susie Q before burning away while exposed to sunlight. After healing Susie Q, Lisa Lisa learns from her that the Super Aya has been sent to St. Moritz in Switzerland, where Kars and Wamu are waiting. Joseph promises Susie Q that he will see her again before he, Caesar, Lisa Lisa, and Messina head off to catch up to the mail train bound for Switzerland. When the group catches up to the train at customs, Wehrmacht soldiers led by Stroheim, rebuilt as a cyborg, arrive and claim the Super Aya for themselves, inviting Joseph and the others to join them at their lodge but Kars attacks it. Stroheim shoots Kars with the machine gun in his mechanical torso, but the latter's brilliant bone blade ability, a series of fast-moving jagged blades on his arm, cuts through the bullets and Stroheim's body. Kars attempts to retrieve the Super Aya, but Stroheim fires a beam of ultraviolet light at him, sending the item sliding towards a cliff edge. Joseph and Kars chase after it and although Joseph grabs the stone, Kars pulls him off the cliff with him, wanting revenge for Acidesai's death. Knowing that Kars would not break the stone, Joseph uses the Super Aya as a shield and prevents his fall by chaining a series of icicles together which Caesar uses to pull him up to safety. Kars lands safely far below, before heading to his daytime hideout. The next day, Caesar heads to the abandoned hotel believed to be Kars' hideout by himself and Lisa Lisa orders Messina to follow him. When Caesar was 10, his hammond using father Mario left him without a word to fight the Pillar Men and when he was 16, he encountered his father in Rome and came across the wall containing the Pillar Men that was rigged with a trap. Mario, failing to recognize his son, died saving Caesar, and in his last moments, Mario instructed Caesar to speak to Lisa Lisa, which he believed was the only person who could stop the Pillar Men and Caesar sought to avenge his family. Back in 1939, Caesar and Messina arrive at the hotel and they are attacked outside by Wamu who refracts the sunlight around himself with wind. Wamu wounds Messina and drags him into the hotel, prompting Caesar to go in after him. Using his new bubble cutter attack and a series of refractive bubble lenses, Caesar wounds Wamu and redirects the sunlight inside the hotel to pin him down. However, when Caesar's shadow covers the sunlight, Wamu critically wounds him with divine sandstorm causing him to use the last of his strength to steal Wamu's piercing into a blood bubble before being crushed by the collapsing ceiling. Wamu, respecting Caesar's resolve, allows the bubble to remain for Joseph. Following Wamu's trail of blood, Joseph and Lisa Lisa encounter a vampire named Wired Beck. Lisa Lisa easily defeats him using her hammond empowered scarf. As a promise to Caesar, Joseph states he will not take the antidote until he has beaten Wamu. Joseph and Lisa Lisa encounter Wamu and Kars, along with a hundred vampire minions. Lisa Lisa holds off their attack, bluffing that if she and Joseph are killed, a time bomb will destroy the Super Aya. She proposes that Joseph fight Wamu whilst she fights Kars with the Super Aya on the line. 
Wamu and Karsk arrange a place for the battle at midnight, keeping Lisa Lisa as insurance. Whilst retrieving the Super Aya, Joseph finds a picture of Irina from 1889 with Speedwagon, Strizo, and an infant. Upon meeting at the arena, Lisa Lisa reveals that she was the baby that Irina rescued from the ship and was raised by Strizo who taught her Hammond and gave her the Super Aya. Joseph and Wamu's battle is revealed to be a chariot race using vampire horses. Joseph puts on Caesar's bandana and prepares to do battle. Before Joseph and Wamu's race begins, it is revealed that during each lap, there will be a different weapon for whoever can grab it from a pillar first. Joseph grabs a sledgehammer from the first pillar, however, Wamu grabs hold of the pillar itself, forcing Joseph to abandon his chariot before he uses the hammer to avoid being trampled by the horses. Wamu launches an attack on Joseph by hiding within his horse, but Joseph turns his divine sandstorm attack back against him with Hammond. Wamu then gouges out his eyes and grows a horn that can sense the wind just as the second lap offers a pair of crossbows. Joseph picks up one that is too big for him to use whilst Wamu uses the wind to guide his shots with a smaller crossbow. Wamu hits Joseph's sides with a reflected show and as he is thrown to the ground, Joseph cocks his crossbow using the momentum of the fall and hits Wamu with a Hammond charged shot by distracting his senses with pebbles. Wamu fires his severed arms at Joseph to cut off his breathing, preventing him from using Hammond, before gathering up wine for his final mode, Gathering Gale. Launching his attack, Wamu fires a stream of wind capable of cutting stone towards Joseph, and after a failed attempt with a firebomb, Joseph strikes Wamu with Caesar's flaming bandana, which Wamu shreds with his wind. However, Wamu breathes in both the oil from the bomb and the burning embers of Caesar's bandana causing him to explode. When the other vampires suddenly attack, he uses the last of his strength to kill them, not wanting them to interfere. Wamu requests that Joseph drinks the antidote from his ring, before dying. And Karst dupes Lisa Lisa into fighting a vampire body double as the real one attacks her from behind. After claiming the Super Aya for himself, Kars sends his vampire army after the weakened Joseph, but he is rescued by Stroheim and his men, along with the Speedwagon Foundation and Smokey, using ultraviolet lights to fight off the vampires. Joseph faces Kars who dangles Lisa Lisa's unconscious body over a bed of sharp crystals forcing him into a vulnerable position, and Smokey realizes that Joseph does not yet know that Lisa Lisa is his mother. Her real name is Elizabeth, and when Joseph was a baby, a zombie servant of Dale that survived the events of 1889 murdered his father George and covered up his death. Elizabeth killed the zombie, but as it was a beloved commander in the Royal Flying Corps, she became a criminal. The Speedwagon Foundation erased her past, and she left Joseph in England to be raised by Irina who kept his past a secret so he would avoid the fate that befell his father and grandfather in the battle between Hammond and the Stone Masks. In 1939, Joseph is forced to cling onto a rope to stop Lisa Lisa from falling to her death and sets his scarf on fire, stating he will finish Kars off before it fully burns. Kars cuts the rope, but he falls into a trap laid by Joseph, who hits him with a hammer attack, impaling him on the sharp crystals below. Joseph rescues Lisa Lisa while Stroheim attempts to finish off Kars with multiple blasts of an ultraviolet beam but the latter secretly puts on the stone mask with the super aya in place and the artificial sunlight channels through the item and into Kars. Kars turns into the ultimate life form and demonstrates his new powers to manipulate his body at a genetic level. The sun rises, killing the rest of the vampire minions, but he remains immune. Joseph grabs the super aya and runs off with Kars in pursuit, transforming into a bird-like creature. He takes one of the German planes to lure Kars away from the others and hopes that he may be able to destroy him by forcing him into a volcanic island. Kars attacks Joseph's plane in various ways causing it to go out of control, but Joseph drops his parachute carrying a dummy to lure him into the path of the plane. He then flies the plane towards the volcano's crater with Kars trapped on the nose while he attempts to escape but Stroheim, who had jumped on board earlier, stops him and rescues Joseph before the plane crashes into the magma. They land safely but they see that Kars is still alive within the magma. 10,000 years ago, Kars invented the stone mask to become immortal and slaughtered all but three of his race after they turned against him. Back in the present, 
Karst blocks the magma with an insulating layer of air bubbles and emerges, slicing off Joseph's hand who subconsciously holds up the super aya, which magnifies the energy into the volcano causing it to erupt. Joseph and Kars are blasted into the air on a large rock while Joseph's severed arm hits Kars and distracts him long enough to be knocked into space by more flying rocks. Landing in the ocean, Joseph is rescued by a fishing boat. In Venice, Susie Q nurses him to health and they marry before he receives a prosthetic hand and alongside Susie Q, and Lisa Lisa, they move to America. Stroheim is killed at the Battle of Stalingrad in 1943 and Smokey becomes the first black mayor in his home state of Georgia. In 1983, a treasure chest engraved with the name Dale is salvaged in the water near the Canary Islands and at JFK Airport in 1987, Joseph is about to depart for Tokyo to see his daughter while Jotaro Kujo, a young man in school uniform, sits in a jail cell. In the 1880s, the vampire Dio, possessed the body of the deceased Jonathan Joestar and survived by hiding in a coffin for a hundred years until 1983, when the coffin holding him is salvaged from the depths of the Atlantic Ocean. Over 1986 and 1987, manifestations of life energy known as stands emerge from Jonathan's grandson Joseph Joestar and teenage great-great-grandson Jotaro Kujo. In Japan in 1987, Jotaro has willingly turned himself into jail, refusing to leave as he believes his stand star platinum, which possesses superhuman speed, strength and precision, is an evil spirit that is possessing him. Joseph flies in from New York with his friend, the Egyptian stand user Muhammad Abdul to coax Jotaro out of his cell. Abdul's fire-manipulating stand magician's red challenges Jotaro which causes star platinum to appear, and when Jotaro leaves his cell, Joseph tells him about Deo and stands and how he is the likely cause of their stands emerging. Elsewhere, Deo senses the presence of the Joe Stars and resolves to kill them. He orders Noriaki Kakioen, a recent transfer to Jotaro's school, to kill Jotaro and as Jotaro walks to school, Kakioen's stand Hierophant Green causes a deep cut to suddenly appear on Jotaro's leg. He falls down a flight of stairs, but uses Star Platinum to divert his fall. Later, as Jotaro heads to the infirmary to have his wound treated, Hierophant Green possesses the nurse's body who stabs one of the other students with a pen before going after Jotaro with inhuman strength. Jotaro uses Star Platinum to pull Hierophant Green out of the nurse's body, leaving her with harsh internal injuries. Star Platinum shrugs off Hierophant Green's emerald splash attack, and pummels him until Kakioen falls unconscious. After leaving the injured nurse to the school faculty, Jotaro takes Kakioen back home to Joseph and Abdul and Joseph explains that Kakioen is Deo's pawn and will likely die in a few days, caused by something implanted in his forehead. Joseph reveals that the object on Kakioen's forehead is a flesh bud that has a tendril going straight into his brain, making him swear loyalty to Deo. Determined to save Kakioen, Jotaro uses Star Platinum to remove the bud from his brain, while Joseph destroys it. The next day, a stand emerges from Jotaro's mother Holly but she does not have enough power to control it and Abdul estimates she only has 50 days to live. As killing Deo is the only way to save Holly, Jotaro uses Star Platinum's precision to analyze spirit photos of Deo taken by Joseph's stand Hermit Purple and based on the faint image of a particular fly Star Platinum spotted, Abdul deduces that Deo is in the Aswan region of Egypt. Kakioen decides to join the group because of a fondness he feels for women like Holly and as the group takes off on a flight towards Egypt, Deo, using a stand power, takes a spirit photo showing him they are on their way to Egypt while Joseph and Jotaro sense Deo's presence, suspecting that there may be a stand user on board. A tiny and quick stag beetle-shaped stand named Tower of Grey, which is responsible for causing mass murders that look like tragic accidents suddenly kills a row of passengers, using their bloody tongues to spell out the word massacre. Before an elderly passenger raises the alarm, Kakioen knocks him out and uses Hierophant Green's emerald splash attack to impale Tower of Grey with spikes from under the seating. When Hierophant Green rips Tower of Grey apart, its user Grey Fly, the elderly man from before, is fatally wounded. Joseph discovers that the pilots have been killed, but he safely lands the plane off the coast of Hong Kong. The group realizes that they must find an alternate way of reaching Egypt that does not put innocent lives at risk and decide to travel by sea. 
As they eat in a restaurant they are joined by the French tourist Jean-Pierre Polnareff who soon reveals himself to be the user of the sword-wielding stand Silver Chariot and one of Dale's assassins. Silver Chariot fights magicians Red in Tiger Bomb Garden but both Polnareff and his stand are engulfed in flames, but before the group can celebrate victory, Polnareff has Silver Chariot shed its protective armor, allowing it to move even faster and produce shadow images that attack from multiple angles. Advil overcomes the clones using Magician's Red's Crossfire Hurricane Special with multiple flames to distract the decoys. Before attacking Polnareff directly from underground with a larger flame, Polnareff admits defeat and resigns himself to be killed by the flames, but realizing his chivalry, Advil releases Polnareff from the flames and Jotaro uses Star Platinum to extract the flesh bud controlling him. As the group heads for the boat they chartered from the Speedwagon Foundation, Polnareff appears and reveals that his true goal is to find and kill a stand user with two right hands, who raped and murdered his younger sister, Sherry. He was swayed by Dale when he promised to help him find the culprit and after learning that the culprit is likely someone in Dale's employ, Polnareff decides to join the Joestar group on their journey to Egypt. They begin their three-day journey towards Singapore, but discover a young stowaway named and on board. She jumps overboard and is threatened by a shark but is rescued by Jotaro until a seafaring stand approaches the boat and the Joestar group suspects and is a stand user working for Dale, but Jotaro exposes the ship's captain as an imposter. The fake Captain Tamil has his stand Dark Blue Moon taken hostage, challenging Jotaro to fight against him in the ocean, where he would have the advantage. Star Platinum beats Dark Blue Moon before it reaches the ocean, knocking its user into the sea. However, acorn barnacles appear on Star Platinum and spread over him, draining its strength and causing Jotaro to fall into the ocean, where Dark Blue Moon creates a deadly whirlpool. Jotaro keeps himself limp, allowing Star Platinum to concentrate its strength and counterattack with its Star Finger technique, defeating Dark Blue Moon and killing its user. Suddenly, several planted bombs explode on board, forcing the group and crewmates to escape on emergency lifeboats. And after signaling for help, a large freighter approaches the boats. On board the freighter, the only life form is a stand using orangutan called Forever, whose stand strength is the freighter itself that kills the sailors in corners and in the shower. Jotaro saves and then fights Forever, but finds himself attacked by various parts of the ship. Forever then traps the Joestar party within the parts of the ship, but Jotaro taunts him then Star Platinum launches a jacket button into Forever's skull with a star finger killing him. Strength loses its form, forcing Jotaro and the others to escape to the lifeboats as the ship reverts to its original form of a tiny boat. Upon hearing of Forever's defeat, Deo's advisor Enya the Hag, who has two right hands, assures him that there are still six other stand users including her son left to face the Joestars. In Singapore, the Joestar group decide to stay in a hotel to plan the next leg of their trip and check in with Anne, but when Polnareff enters his room, he realizes that one of Deo's assassins, Devo the Cursed, is hiding in his refrigerator. Polnareff easily defeats Devo who throws himself off the hotel balcony and disappears. He informs Abdul and Joseph of the situation and arranges to regroup with them later but suddenly receives a cut on his leg, and is strapped to the underside of his bed as the culprit is revealed to be a doll that Devo possessed using his stand Ebony Devil. Polnareff struggles to fight against the doll as Silver Chariot cannot accurately attack in areas that Polnareff cannot see until he managed to do so by using the reflections of pieces of a mirror he shattered earlier. Unable to learn anything from his opponent, Polnareff cuts the doll to pieces, which in turn kills Devo, who had been controlling his stand from within the hotel. As Polnareff deals with authorities, Joseph uses Hermit Purple on his room's television, rapidly changing channels to reveal a hidden message warning them that Kakioan is Deo's servant. Rubber Soul, one of Deo's assassins, uses his blob-like stand Yellow Temperance to disguise himself as Kakioan and as the two take their fight onto the cable cars, Yellow Temperance begins to consume Jotaro's body but he defeats him by dragging him down into the sea below forcing Rubber Soul to lower Yellow Temperance's guard to breathe and leaving him open to a direct physical attack. Rubber Soul then reveals the stands of Deo's next assassins are Death, the Empress, the Emperor, and the Hanged Man, the last of which is used by J. Guile, the man with two right hands. 
Rubber Soul makes a last-ditch attack on Jotaro by using Yellow Temperance to pull Jotaro into the drain but Star Platinum punches the drain, raising water pressure to make the manhole hit Rubber Soul. Jotaro rejoins the group as they continue their journey to India but unbeknownst to them, N is following them in the next train car. The Joestar group arrives in Calcutta, which presents a considerable culture shock and Palmerev sees J. Guile stand the hanged man in the mirror of a restaurant's toilet. He smashes the mirror before the stand gets too close and decides he should hunt down Jay Guile on his own, despite Abdul's warnings that they should remain together. Elsewhere, Whole Horse, another of Deo's assassins, teams up with Jay Guile to kill Polnareff. The next day, Polnareff finds the two but Jay Guile disappears as the rainy sky clears and Whole Horse uses his stand the Emperor, which takes the form of a gun, to fire a bullet at Polnareff. The bullet is a part of the Emperor and Dodge's silver chariot going for Polnareff, until Abdul arrives and pushes him to the ground. He attempts to melt the bullet with Magician's Red but the Hanged Man emerges from the reflection of a puddle and stabs Abdul in the back allowing the bullet to strike his forehead. Leaving Kakioan and Polnareff to mourn Abdul's death. J. Guile provokes Polnareff into attacking his Hanged Man within a glass window, using the broken shards of glass to pin him down, but Kakioan convinces Polnareff to escape in a car. After realizing that the Hanged Man is in the car, they crash the vehicle and figure out that the Hanged Man is actually a stand of light that jumps between reflective surfaces. The Hanged Man jumps into the reflection of the eyes of a young boy and then nearby beggars, trapping Polnareff and Kakioan within the group of beggars. But Kakioan flips a shiny gold coin in the air, bringing everyone's gaze, along with the Hanged Man towards it, allowing Silver Chariot to defeat the Hanged Man and kill J. Guile. When Whole Horse realizes that he is dead, he tries to flee, but is caught by Jotaro and Joseph, whom the latter says have just buried Abdul. Polnareff prepares to kill Whole Horse but is stopped by the latter's lover Nina, allowing Whole Horse to escape. After treating Nina's wounds, Joseph urges the group to continue their journey towards Egypt, unaware that a drop of Nina's blood has caused a mysterious growth to appear on his arm. The Joestar group, joined by Nina, travel by bus to Varanasi and when the doctor at the clinic attempts to cut Joseph's growth off, the growth grows a face and kills the doctor with his scalpel, revealing itself to be the Empress stand and alerts the police, implicating Joseph for the doctor's murder. He tries to fight off the Empress, but it is unaffected by his Hammond techniques. The Empress stops him from moving, but Joseph uses Hermit Purple to break free and searches for its user as the growth grows larger and stronger. He plunges his arm into a barrel containing coal tar and although the stand cannot be suffocated, the coal tar solidifies around it and Joseph uses Hermit Purple to rip the immobilized Empress to shreds causing the Empress's user Nina to also be torn to shreds. Driving to Pakistan, the group encounter and hitchhiking and they reluctantly take her with them until a red car plays a deadly game of tag with them and eventually pushes them over a cliff. Kakioan uses Hierophant Green to hook a cable to the other car and Jotaro uses Star Platinum to pull them to safety, knocking the other car down the cliff in the process. Just then, a voice comes from their own radio, revealing the red car to be the Wheel of Fortune stand, which emerges from the ground, destroying the Joestar group's car then transforms, chasing them and soaking them with projectiles of gasoline. Wheel of Fortune's user, ZZ, uses the sparks on his car to try to set Jotaro ablaze. However, the latter avoids the flames by using Star Platinum to dig underground, destroy Wheel of Fortune and send ZZ flying out into the open. After chaining him to a rock, the group take his car, which had reverted to its original dilapidated form, and continue their journey while Enya decides to confront the group personally with her justice stand. Joseph convinces En to return to her home in Hong Kong and the group stops in a nearby town and shrouded in fog where they come across a body lying on the street, riddled with bloodless holes they suspect a stand user is involved. Feeling they should leave the town, Joseph jumps towards what he believes to be their car, only to narrowly avoid being impaled by a spiked gate. Enya, claiming to be an innocent old woman, leads them to a nearby hotel and Whole Horse shows up, having tracked the group. However, Enya takes revenge on him for abandoning Jay Guile and attacks his wrist with scissors before using her stand justice, which takes the form of the fog itself, to make a hole from his wound. 
Justice then enters the wound to make Whole Horse shoot the Emperor at himself and Enya sets her sights on her next target, Palnareff who has become separated from the others. She tries to hide the body from him but Whole Horse, who is still alive, alerts Palnareff that Enya is about to attack him just as she uses her fog to control the dead civilians of the village like zombies and chase Palnareff who retreats to a bathroom. Palnareff is then hit by a surprise attack through the bathroom door's keyhole, allowing Justice to take control of his tongue and force him to lick the toilet in humiliation. Enya is interrupted by Jotaro, who suspected something was amiss when she refers to him by his real name as they all used fake names when signing the hotel ledger causing her to inflict a wound on his leg. But Star Platinum inhales Justice's fog-like form, suffocating Enya until she passes out. Leaving the hotel, the village is revealed to be a cemetery and Jotaro suggests that they take Enya with them to learn more about Dale but Whole Horse hijacks the car, advising the group to kill her while they still can. Now traveling by horse and carriage, the Joestar group stop by a kebab shop in Karachi and the store owner Steely Dan implants Deo's flesh bud in Inyaba's body with his microscopic stand the lovers to keep her from revealing the truth about Deo's stand, killing her. The lovers then enters Joseph's brain, where it causes any pain inflicted on Steely Dan to be amplified and sent to Joseph. It also begins implanting a flesh bud which will kill Joseph in 10 minutes. Though angry, Jotaro restrains himself as he caters to Steely Dan's whims to prevent Joseph from being hurt while the latter uses Hermit Purple to make a spirit photo showing the inside of his brain, allowing Kakioan and Palnareff to shrink down their stands, enter his body and locate the lovers to save his life. In Joseph's brain, the lovers disguise himself as Hierophant Green and then make several clones of itself, leaving Kakioan and Palnareff unable to determine which one is the real stand. Meanwhile, Jotaro is humiliated, beaten and forced to steal from a jewelry store by Steely Dan, all while making notes so he can make him pay later. In Joseph's brain, Hierophant Green finds and attacks the real lovers with its tentacles and forces the lovers out of Joseph's body with an emerald splash, giving him the opportunity to destroy the flesh bud in his brain with Hammond. Realizing he has been defeated, Steely Dan tries to divert Jotaro's attention so the lovers can enter him instead. But the lovers is quickly spotted and caught by Star Platinum. In desperation, Steely Dan tries to have the lovers enter a young girl's ear, but it is stopped by Hierophant Green's tentacle, which was attached to the lover's leg before it escaped Joseph's brain. This stops Steely Dan's movements completely, allowing Star Platinum to brutally pummel Steely Dan as revenge for everything he put Jotaro through. The group then ride through the Arabian desert on camels, and a long while later, they realize that the sun is still in the sky at 8 o'clock in the evening. With the temperature rapidly increasing, the group realizes what they thought was the sun is actually a stand with the same name. Kakioan attempts to judge the distance of the sun with Hierophant Green, but comes under attack, which also ruins their water supply and Star Platinum digs a hole in the ground to give them shade. Kakioan finds a rock in the middle of the desert which is a mirror image of another and when Jotaro throws a rock in its direction, a crack seemingly appears in the sky, and the sun is defeated, restoring the night sky. The group walk over to the crack to find the sun's user, Arabia Fats, knocked out cold in a mirrored blind where he had been hiding. Kakioan dreams that he is in a deserted amusement park with a dog which is killed and the stand death 13 attacks. After Palnareff wakes him up, Kakioan has no recollection over the cut on his hand and gets a sense of familiarity when he sees the dog he saw in his dreams killed in the same manner. Later, Joseph reluctantly agrees to fly a sick baby called Manish Boy to the hospital in the light plane he purchased. While in flight, both Kakioan and Palnareff fall asleep and find themselves at the same amusement park dream, both attacked by Death 13, but find that they cannot summon their stands to fight back. Before Death 13 lands a mortal blow on Polnareff, Joseph wakes him, leaving Kakioan in the dream who thrashes about in his sleep and causes Joseph to crash the plane. As the team sets up camp, Kakioan sees that he has cut the words baby stand into his arm during the dream, realizing that the baby is the stand user, but is unsuccessful in convincing the others. His suspicions that Manish Boy is a stand user are confirmed after he witnesses Manish Boy skillfully kill a scorpion while hiding the evidence, and after failing to convince everyone that he attempts to attack the boy with Hierophant Green, but is knocked out by Palnareff. 
When they fall asleep, Jotaro, Joseph, and Polnareff appear in the Dream Amusement Park where they are all subjected to the whims of Death 13. As Kakioin summoned Hierophant Green before he was knocked out, he brings it into the Dream World to fight Death 13. Manish Boy attempts to use the Dream World to his advantage and slice Hierophant Green in half, but Kakioin instead sends his stand into Death 13's ears. Forcing Manish Boy to heal Kakioin's wounds and accept defeat. The next morning, no one recalls what happened in the dream except Kakioin who retained his memories as a result of his stand being inside the dream and he decides to leave Manish Boy at the nearest town but not before he mixes Manish Boy's feces into the food that Joseph later feeds him as a final revenge. The Joestar group arrive on an island by the Red Sea said to be inhabited by Abdul's father. Alone on the island shore, Polnareff discovers an aged lamp and after he rubs it, a genie named Cameo appears and grants Polnareff three wishes. Polnareff is skeptical until his wish for money causes a treasure chest full of gold coins to appear nearby. Wondering if his wishes can bring people back from the dead, Polnareff wishes that his sister Sherry and Abdul can be brought back to life. Sherry seems to be resurrected, but is revived as a ravenous predator who viciously attacks Polnareff to consume his flesh and Cameo explains that he is actually the Stand Judgment who can create zombie-like creatures from the earth based on the wisher's desires. The terrified Polnareff tries to use his final wish to wish Sherry away, however, Cameo gloatingly tells Polnareff that he has already used his third wish to revive Abdul. In accordance with his third wish, Cameo makes a figure of Abdul that joins Sherry in attacking Polnareff, biting off pieces of his flesh as he is unable to use Silver Chariot due to Cameo's interference. The real Abdul, who had survived his encounter with Whole Horse because the seemingly fatal bullet had only grazed his skull, saves Polnareff from the clay doll versions of Avdol and Sherry. Cameo is initially too strong for their stands, until Avdol then brings out the full strength of magicians red against him, effectively dissipating the stand. Polnareff and Avdol then L find a piece of bamboo sticking out of the ground that turns out to be the breathing tube of the Cameo user and the two drops mud. Bugs then urinate into the bamboo, forcing the user to the surface. After reuniting with the group, Joseph reveals he did not bury Abdul but tended to his wounds and Kakioin explains he kept Abdul being alive a secret from Polnareff to prevent Dale from finding out. Abdul further reveals he had disguised himself as his father to purchase a submarine for the group. The Joestar group begin their journey beneath the Red Sea and along the way, Joseph makes a call to his wife Susie Q, who is unaware of his circumstances, making sure she does not travel to Japan to check on Holly, whose condition continues to worsen. Just as they approach the Egyptian shore, Joseph is suddenly attacked by the High Priestess Stan, which has the ability to transform into any mineral substance and as the submarine descends into chaos from the Stan's attacks, it begins to leak and sink. Jotaro answers another call from Suzy Q who becomes concerned about what she hears and with the submarine at the bottom of the ocean and running low on oxygen, Jotaro attempts to crush High Priestess with Star Platinum, but it escapes by transforming into a razor. Unable to directly attack High Priestess, the group attempts to escape to the surface while Suzy Q and her butler Roses prepare to fly to Japan. After finding some scuba equipment, the group prepares to flee and as they exit the submarine, they discover High Priestess has disguised itself as Polnareff's regulator and attacks him. However, Joseph and Kakioin save him using their stands and leave safely but while swimming across some rocks, they find High Priestess has disguised itself as the sea bed, sucking them inside its mouth. As the stand's user, Midler gloats from the surface, the group flatters her, trying to appeal to her vanity, but this only serves to anger her further. She tries to crush Jotaro between High Priestess's teeth but he breaks them with Star Platinum and the group escape reaching the surface, where they find Midler incapacitated and disfigured as a result of Jotaro's attack. Thirty days after leaving Japan and defeating many of Deo's assassins, the Joestar group finally arrive in Egypt. Jotaro and Joseph assure Suzy Q of their safety before continuing their pursuit of Deo who has summoned nine more stand users. Two representatives from the Speedwagon Foundation bring a stand user dog named Iggy to Jotaro's group, whose stand the fool controls sand. Joseph is also informed of Holly's situation, learning that she has two weeks left before a water-based stand aimed Geb emerges from the canteen used by the Speedwagon Foundation representatives, and kills the two of them. 
Jotaro's group attempts to hide from Geb, only for it to travel through the sand and surprise them, injuring Kakioin's eyes. The group hide in their car when they realize Ndao, the stand user they cannot see, is using sound to find them and Geb pulls it into the sand to kill them, but Iggy, sensing the attack and Ndao's position for kilometers away, flees the car. Avdal attempts to set up a trap for Geb, but Ndao figures it out at the last second and Geb avoids an attack from Magician's Red and injures Avdal. Realizing Iggy can detect Ndao's attack, Jotaro coerces him into summoning the fool, which can glide and hitches a ride against Iggy's wishes so they can head towards Ndao to stop him from attacking. As they get closer, both Iggy's stubbornness and Ndao's cunning puts Jotaro at risk until Star Platinum grabs and throws him in Ndao's direction, forcing Iggy to protect himself with the fool while also creating a distraction long enough for Star Platinum to injure Ndao. As he goes down, Ndao off himself through the use of Geb so he cannot be interrogated over Deo's plans and elsewhere. A traveling manga artist asks to see Boingo's comic book titled Oingo Boingo Brothers Adventure and discovers its odd contents, but is scared off by Boingo's older brother Oingo, the brothers prepare to head off to Aswan to confront Jotaro's group, but decide to wait for the next bus, as it is soon revealed that Boingo's comic book had predicted the artist's death. As the Joestar group arrive in Aswan to get Kakioin and Avdal into the hospital, they are targeted by Deo's assassin Zoingo, whose stand Knum changes his face, and Boingo, whose stand Thoth is a comic book that predicts the near future. Thoth predicts that Jotaro, Joseph, and Polnareff will drink poison tea and Oingo poisons the group's tea. But as they drink it the group spits it out when Iggy causes a commotion. Thoth predicts that Oingo will rob a man and that Jotaro's head will be split in two by a bomb Oingo planted that looks like an orange when he heads to the hospital. Oingo robs the man, and plants the bomb in the group's car, but is forced to disguise himself as Jotaro when caught off guard by the return of Joseph and Polnareff, and Jotaro having headed to the hospital before them. Oingo rides in the car with Joseph and Polnareff and he soon realizes that while disguised as Jotaro, he would be the bomb's victim and escapes the car to change back but Polnareff discards the bomb and he steps on it, wounding him while Boingo is hospitalized by some thugs hired by the man Oingo robbed earlier. With Kakioin needing to spend a few more days in hospital to heal his eyes, the others continue across the Nile River by boat to calm Ombo. Meanwhile, a young man named Shaka discovers the sword-shaped stand Anubis and when he draws it out of its sheath, Anubis suddenly moves on its own, killing Shaka's family and declares him as its master before sending him to pursue Jotaro's group. Shaka and Anubis face off against Polnareff, with him struggling against his ability to pass through anything to reach its target. When Shaka attempts a surprise attack, Polnareff uses a secret technique to deflect a piece of silver chariot sword into his neck, knocking him unconscious. When he inspects the sword for himself, he comes close to being swayed by its influence before Jotaro and the others arrive. As Jotaro and Polnareff stop by a barber shop on their way to take the sword to a police station, Anubis possesses the shop's barber, Khan, who prepares to kill Polnareff. He struggles to defend himself against Khan, after Anubis has memorized all of Silver Chariot's moves from before until Star Platinum snaps him in half. Freeing Khan from its control. But as Jotaro and Polnareff plan to throw the sword into the Nile, a police officer interferes and Polnareff inadvertently draws Anubis, thus becoming possessed. Jotaro struggles to fight against Anubis, who possesses not only Polnareff's speed and stand abilities, but also knowledge of every move Star Platinum uses against him and stabs Jotaro's stomach then proceeds to push it in further, but the latter uses this opportunity to pin it in place while Star Platinum smashes it to pieces. Anubis possesses a young boy with the remaining half of the blade and attempts to make the boy throw it at Polnareff until Iggy trips the boy, resulting in Anubis ending up at the bottom of the Nile. Kakioin is informed that the Speedwagon Foundation is taking over his medical treatment, allowing his eyes to heal faster. Meanwhile, as Jotaro's group arrive in Luxor, Joseph gets shocked by Batet, a stand disguised as an electrical socket. He decides to have the group stay in Luxor for the night but the next morning, Joseph quickly realizes he has become a human magnet as a result of the shock, causing anything metallic to become a potentially lethal weapon for him. Joseph is trapped on an escalator by Bastet's user Mariah. Resulting in his hands nearly being chopped off on the landing platform and Abdul rescues him, but comes under Bastet's influence as well. 
As Joseph and Abdul pursue Mariah, they become stuck together by their magnetism and try to get themselves detached from each other, facing all kinds of embarrassment in the process, only to wind up stuck on a railroad track as a train approaches. Magician's Red burns a hole underneath the tracks before they are run over, allowing Abdul and Joseph to escape. Despite being weighed down by an increasing array of metallic objects the two confront Mariah in a pincer attack, but are caught in a trap as she sets off several loose power cables that are drawn to their magnetism. However, the duo utilize their magnetism to their own advantage, crushing all of Mariah's bones with their combined weight until she passes out and relinquishes her power. Meanwhile, another stand user, Alessi, sets his sights on Jotaro, Palnareff, and Nigi. While the three go off in search of Joseph and Avdol, who are busy with their battle with Mariah, they are followed by Alessi, who uses the power of the stand set which resides in his shadow to turn Polnareff into a child. Along with his smaller stature, Polnareff's mind also starts reverting as he gradually loses his adult memories, and unable to ask Jotaro for help, he is only able to defend himself from Alessi using Silver Chariot, who is also affected by Set's power. Barely managing to escape Alessi after Silver Chariot's blade hits his neck by chance, Polnareff is picked up by a young woman who takes him to her home to treat his injuries but Alessi attacks him as he takes a bath. He attempts to drown Polnareff in the bath, only for his bodily instincts to save him at the last second and discovering that Alessi had used his power to turn the woman into a fetus that will die in a short amount of time, Polnareff attempts to escape with her, turning even younger every time he touches Set's shadow. Driven into a bedroom, Polnareff uses a fish tank, a ball, and a mirror to hide himself and get the drop on Alessi, who soon winds up in front of Jotaro. Alessi hit Jotaro with Set's shadow, only to find that he was still powerful and ruthless as a kid and knocks Alessi out to cancel the age curse before he and Polnareff enact revenge. Relieved to find the woman restored with her memories of the event a haze. Polnareff decides to keep his identity a secret from her before he and Jotaro reunite with the rest of the group and after creating another spirit photo with Hermit Purple, Joseph determines Deo's hideout is in Cairo. Upon arriving there, the group heads to a cafe where one of Deo's assassins, a gambling man named Daniel J. Darby claims to know where Deo's mansion is and suggests a friendly wager for his intel with their souls on the line. Polnareff goes first and the two bet on which of two pieces of fish a cat would go for first which loses, and Darby's stand Osiris steals his soul and implants it in a poker chip, with the cat revealed to be Darby's pet. Joseph offers his soul in a wager against Darby and they bet to see who will cause a glass full to the brim to overflow by dropping coins into it. On his turn, Joseph tries to cheat by dropping more liquid into the glass, knowing that it will overflow on Darby's turn but Darby easily puts his coin in and Joseph subconsciously admits defeat, leaving the other to steal his soul. Jotaro discovers Darby had used a small piece of chocolate to change the way the glass appeared to be full and let it melt and decides to face him next at poker. Darby prepares his and Jotaro's game of poker by splitting up Polnareff and Joseph's souls into six poker chips each he will use to bet with, and giving Jotaro six chips to represent his own soul. Jotaro picks a boy near the cafe to deal for them, not knowing everyone in and near the cafe is in Darby's employ. He loses three chips in his first hand against Darby, and in the second hand Darby is dealt four kings and Jotaro, not looking at his cards, raises all of his soul and Abdul's soul on his bet. Darby sees Jotaro's bet and raises it, betting the rest of his, Joseph and Polnareff's souls. Jotaro sees his bet with Kakio and soul and then raises it with the soul of his mother Holly for knowledge of Deo's stand but Darby. Unsure if Jotaro is cheating and unable to call, mentally folds as he goes catatonic, making him unable to provide information on Deo. All of the souls he won in bets are released and Avdol realizes that Jotaro had been dealt a bad hand. Days before the Joestar group reach Cairo, Whole horse witnesses Deo's power firsthand while given a final chance to redeem himself and he is partnered with Boingo, whom he kidnapped from Aswan, convincing Boingo to take out the Joestar group with him. Meanwhile, as Jotaro's group try to find information about Deo's hideout, Joseph learns that Holly's condition has worsened and has only a few more days to live. Thoth gives Whole Horse an absurd prediction that he will have a chance to kill the group by sticking his fingers up Polnareff's nose but the latter gets the jump on Whole Horse, forcing him to go through with the prediction. 
But as the others approach, whole horse is uncertain how the rest of the prophecy is supposed to be fulfilled. He holds Polnareff at gunpoint in order to hide from Jotaro and the others, but Polnareff gets out of the situation by sneezing and upon being exposed, Whole Horse spills some olive oil which causes a truck to skid out of control and hit Jotaro's group. Hiding from Jotaro, the only one not left unconscious by the crash, Whole Horse and Boingo follow Thotha's next prediction, which states Whole Horse's bullets will go through Jotaro's forehead after being fired through the pipe system at noon. However, they fire at the wrong time, and Polnareff's sneeze causes Jotaro to move out of the bullet's path that then redirect themselves through Thotha's comic page depicting Jotaro's face, hospitalizing Whole Horse and Boingo as well when he inadvertently angers Iggy. Iggy comes across Deo's hideout and finds it is guarded by a sadistic falcon named Pet Shop who killed two large dogs and while Iggy feigned being a dumb dog to not get involved, he reluctantly ends up saving the young owner of the dogs from Pet Shop with the boy running off. Forced to go on the run from Pet Shop and the ice attacks from his stand Horus, Iggy escapes into the sewers, using the Fool to counterattack Horus. Undeterred, Pet Shop fully manifests Horus and freezes his wounds while preventing Iggy from escaping. Having been caught by Pet Shop's ice attacks, Iggy is forced to gnaw off his front left paw and escape the sewers via its water supply, using the Fool to hide at the bottom of the river. Pet Shop dives into the river after Iggy and uses his ice in an attempt to crush his dome. Digging downwards only to find Pet Shop waiting for him, Iggy uses the pressure from the collapsing dome behind him to rush forward and clamp Pet Shop's beak shut just as he prepares an ice missile, causing Pet Shop to destroy himself. Exhausted from blood loss and nearly drowning, Iggy is rescued by the boy he protected earlier and a recovered Kakioan reunites with the group. After having a Speedwagon Foundation doctor treat Iggy's injuries who then leads them to Deo's hideout. Daniel J. Darby's younger brother Terence brings out his stand Adam, who drags Jotaro, Kakioan, and Joseph into an illusory world created by another user Stan. There, Terence reveals himself to collect the souls of his defeated opponent like his brother, placing them in his doll collection and with Adam attaching a piece of itself to Jotaro's soul earlier, Terence challenges the trio to a series of video games with their souls on the line in order to have him relinquish Jotaro. Terence first challenges Kakioan in a racing video game, with both players using their stands to perform advanced techniques. And with the race neck and neck throughout most of the course, the pair soon enter a dark tunnel with Terence gaining a slight lead. Kakioan uses his higher power level to knock Terence off the course, only to realize he unknowingly helped him win with his soul transferred into one of his dolls. Jotaro steps up to face Terence in a baseball video game and wagers his soul against Kakioan's. Although Jotaro, who never played a video game before, gets two of his batters knocked out at the start, he soon figures out the controls by his third batter and scores four home runs, though Terence uses a change of pitcher to catch Jotaro's third batter out. As Terence goes on the offensive, predicting Jotaro's moves after declaring his bats and scoring three home runs, Joseph assumes that Terence has the power to read people's minds, and Jotaro himself declares his next pitch. Terence uses Adam to read if Jotaro is telling the truth in the form of yes or no questions and despite Jotaro's soul not lying about his pitch, they turn out to be different from expected which leads Terence to suspect that Jotaro is somehow cheating. Unknown to Terence, Joseph was using Hermit Purple on the game controller and he subconsciously admits defeat and releases Kakioan's soul before Jotaro pummels him, opening up a way out of the game room. Meanwhile, Dale's right-hand man Vanilla Ice cuts off his own head so Dale can use his blood to complete his assimilation of Jonathan's body and uses his own blood to bring Vanilla Ice back to life, stating he will get blood from someone else and sends him to attack the intruders. Meanwhile, Polnareff, Avdol, and Iggy venture inside the mansion and Iggy uses the Fool to take down a stand user named Kenny G to stop the illusions that made the mansion into a labyrinth. Avdol is then killed when he pushes Polnareff and Iggy away from Vanilla Ice's stand cream, which disintegrates anything that enters the void inside its mouth besides its user. Vanilla Ice uses cream to prevent Polnareff and Iggy from reaching Dale while blindly destroying most of the mansion and the stand limits Polnareff's movement by erasing part of his foot. Hiding in the confusion, Iggy uses a sand replica of Dale to lure Vanilla Ice into a false sense of security to attack, but he sees through the deception and proceeds to attack him in a fit of rage. 
Polnareff uses Iggy's leftover sand to determine Vanilla Ice's location and stab him in his mouth, but Vanilla Ice retaliates by having Cream erase part of Polnareff's body parts and decides to finish him off as the latter is left to accept his impending death. Iggy uses the fool to pull Polnareff out of Cream's reach before he dies from his injuries and angered at having lost another comrade. Polnareff skewers Vanilla Ice through the head and snaps his neck and while Vanilla Ice is revealed to have unknowingly become a vampire when Dale revived him, Polnareff exploits his inexperience by destroying him with sunlight. Meanwhile, Susie pays a visit to Japan to visit Holly, fully understanding that Holly's life is in danger while deeming that keeping Jotaro and Joseph a secret is the best way she can help. Back at Dale's mansion, Jotaro, Joseph, and Kakyoin come across the vampire loser who is forced to lead the three to Dale after his attempt to disguise himself as an innocent woman failed. And Polnareff, having patched up his injuries, comes face to face with Dale. He makes repeated tries to climb up the stairs and finds himself back where he started. Realizing it is the power of Dale's stand, the world. Dale is forced back upstairs when Jotaro and the others arrive as they have reached his coffin and force Loser to open it up and he suddenly finds himself inside the coffin. Sensing murderous intent from behind them, the Joestar group escape out the window. After sunset, with Jotaro sticking with Polnareff, Dale hijacks the limousine of Wilson Phillips, a visiting senator, and forces him to pursue Joseph and Kakioin. Dale has the world block Hierophant Green's attacks in determining that the stand is a close-range stand like Star Platinum, Kakioin comes up with a plan to expose its secrets. He uses Hierophant Green to surround Dale with wires that automatically attack him with Emerald Splash once touched but a second after, Hierophant Green's barrier is torn down while Dale fatally wounds him. Kakioin deduces the nature of the world's ability in his final moment and using the last of his strength to use an Emerald Splash to smash a clock face as a clue for Joseph. Using this, Joseph figures out that Dale has the power to stop time and realizing there are some limits to Dale's power, he conducts his Hammond through Hermit Purple to keep Dao at a distance, and rushes to warn Jotaro about the world but Dao catches up to Joseph and freezes time long enough to stab him in the neck with a throwing knife. Furious, Jotaro ignores Joseph's warning to keep his distance and instead confronts Dao in a close-range stand battle. The latter stops time to try and finish Jotaro, but due to Star Platinum being the same type of stand as the world, Jotaro appears to be able to both perceive him and move himself slightly while time is stopped. Dao initially assumes this to be a trick Jotaro pulled by planting a magnet on him to move his fingers. But this turns out to be a trick itself to make Dao think that Jotaro truly cannot move. He uses Star Platinum to counterattack during stop time and realizing that Jotaro can only move for a brief moment while time is stopped, Dao stays out of his range and attacks using time stop knives, landing some hits on Jotaro, who survives by hiding magazines under his clothes. While he plays dead, Polnareff launches a surprise attack and nearly destroys Dao's brain, only for him to stop time and turn his attention to him. Drawing Dao's attention away from Polnareff, Jotaro uses Star Platinum to stop his own heart, until he gets close to him, allowing him to bash Dao's skull. The latter tricks Jotaro into knocking him near where Joseph is and then drains his blood and completely assimilates Jonathan's body. The duration of the world's ability increase as a result of Dao draining Joseph's blood and he stops time and brings down a road roller on top of Jotaro. The latter also stops time at the last second, and uses Star Platinum to break Dao's leg and smashes the world in the same spot. Destroying it and Dao in the process. Following the battle, Jotaro works with the Speedwagon Foundation to revive Joseph by transfusing the blood that remained in Jonathan's body which they later expose to sunlight to ensure Dale is completely destroyed. With their journey finally over, Polnareff returns to France while Jotaro and Joseph return home to Holly, who is making a complete recovery, and they continue with their life. In April 1999, marine explorer Jotaro Kujo travels to the Japanese town of Morio where he meets two high school freshmen, Koichi Hirose and Josuke Higashikata. Josuke uses his stand Crazy Diamond to restore destroyed objects and heal wounds and Jotaro tells him that he is the illegitimate son of his grandfather Joseph Joestar and will receive some of Joseph's inheritance. 
After school, Josuke encounters a convenience store robber and steps in after the robber insults his hair but discovers that the robber was being possessed by Aqua Necklace, a stand used by the escaped killer Angelo Katagir and escapes into the sewers while threatening to kill Josuke. Angelo uses a water pipe to get Aqua Necklace into the house so it can kill Josuke's mother Tomoko but Josuke extracts it from her body with Crazy Diamond and traps it inside a bottle. Angelo disguises Aqua Necklace as Cognac and kills Josuke's grandfather Ryohei, the man that arrested Angelo, after drinks from the bottle, and though Josuke uses Crazy Diamond to restore Ryohei's body, he cannot bring him back from the dead. Josuke and Jotaro wait out Angelo at their house for three days before realizing that he was biding his time until a rainy day. The two are overwhelmed by Aqua Necklace freely moving through puddles and steam until Josuke tricks it into entering a rubber glove he secretly swallowed and upon finding Angelo, Josuke uses Crazy Diamond to fuse Angelo into a nearby rock. After being fused into stone, Angelo reveals to Josuke and Jotaro that he received his stand ability before his execution when a man in a school uniform shot him with a centuries-old bow and arrow. Mentioning the name of the Joestar family's enemy, Dao. Angelo attempts to use this discussion to distract the two and attack a nearby child with Aqua Necklace but when he insults Josuke's hair, the latter completely fuses Angelo with the stone. Realizing that the bow and arrow may be what originally gave Deo his stand, Jotaro decides to remain in Morio to investigate. The next day, Josuke and Koichi pass by a derelict house where Josuke is jumped by Okuyasu Nijimura as his older brother Keicho fires an arrow through Koichi's neck. Josuke is kept from reaching Koichi's aid by Okuyasu, whose stand the hand can scrape away anything its right hand touches and instantly close the gap left afterwards. Josuke uses this to his advantage by tricking Okuyasu into removing the space between him and some potted plants, which launch towards him and knock him out and after Keicho drags Koichi inside the house, Josuke follows them. As he enters the house, Keicho attempts to attack him with his stand bad company, but hits Okuyasu when Okuyasu tries to attack him from behind. Josuke quickly takes Okuyasu outside and uses Crazy Diamond to treat his wounds but Bad Company injures his hand while escaping. Josuke cannot use Crazy Diamond's ability on himself and re-enters the house to find Koichi in a booby-trapped second-floor room. Okuyasu repays the favor by closing the distance between Koichi and the door before going back outside to remain neutral and Josuke heals Koichi but before the two attempt to escape from bad company, an entire army of toy soldiers attack as Keicho makes himself known once Koichi is revealed to have awakened a stand. He forces Koichi to bring out his stand, which appears to just be a seemingly useless egg and targets Josuke again who uses Crazy Diamond's ability to fire bad company's own missiles back at Keicho. Reaching the attic where the bow and arrow are, Josuke and Koichi find the Nijimura brother's father, a former servant of Deo's who mutated into a mindless creature after Deo died and the flesh buds he put in his head lost control. Keicho explains that he has been finding a stand user who can kill his father, who cannot be killed by conventional means and seems obsessed with searching through an old chest. Josuke uses Crazy Diamond to restore a torn-up photograph of the Nijimura family inside the chest, hinting that the father still retains memories of his old life. Just as Josuke offers to help Keicho and Okuyasu find a way to cure their father in exchange for the bow and arrow, Keicho is attacked by the electrical stand, Red Hot Chili Pepper, who steals the bow and arrow and kills Keicho by dragging him through an electrical outlet. As Jotaro receives a warning from Red Hot Chili Pepper's user not to interfere any further, Okuyasu decides to befriend Josuke and go to school with him. Tamami Kobayashi tries to blackmail Koichi into paying for the cat he seemingly ran over with his bike and brings out his stand the lock to literally weigh Koichi down with guilt. Okuyasu and Josuke soon arrive to help him, but Kobayashi tricks Okuyasu into feeling guilty for punching him and he falls under the thrall of the lock. Josuke discovers that the cat was fake and heals Kobayashi's injuries, freeing both Koichi and Okuyasu from their locks, though Kobayashi gets away with Koichi's money. Upon arriving home, Koichi is shocked to find Kobayashi, who tricks his mother into thinking that he had stolen from him and puts both her and Koichi's sister under the lock's power. Koichi's anger causes his stand egg to hatch into Echoes, whose ability is to plant literal sound effects on whatever it touches, driving Kobayashi crazy with repeated sounds. 
He tries to take his revenge by tricking Koichi's mother and sister into thinking Koichi had stabbed him, aiming to drive Koichi's mother to kill herself until Koichi uses Echo's ability to convince his mother to believe in him, freeing both her and his sister from the lock and Kobayashi resigns himself to be Koichi's servant. He informs Josuke and Koichi about a stand user in their school named Tashikazu Hazamada who allegedly caused his friend to gouge his own eye out and while investigating Hazamada's locker, Josuke comes across his stand surface, a wooden dummy which turns into a copy of Josuke and takes control of his movements. After seemingly defeating both Josuke and Koichi, Hazamada aims to use his Josuke copy to lure Jotaro into a trap. Having used their respective abilities to protect each other from his attack, Josuke and Koichi use their stand's powers to meet up with Jotaro before Hazamada and his stand surface takes control of Josuke and tries to have him kill Jotaro in his stead. But two bikers Hazamada had attacked on the way to the meeting place dish out their revenge after learning of his plans from Josuke. Koichi meets with his classmate Yukako Yamagishi who confesses her love for him, but also loses her temper at the thought of being turned down. When she leaves, Koichi realizes that her hair has been left behind in his drink and the next day, Yukako becomes angered with the class representative for insulting Koichi, using her stand Love Deluxe, which allows her to control her own hair, to attempt to burn the class rep alive. After Josuke and Okuyasu arrive to save the class rep, they warn Koichi about Yukako's stand and encourage him to try and act like a delinquent so that she will lose interest. But this plan backfires, and Yukako kidnaps and brings him to an abandoned summer villa, where she begins torturing him in an attempt to mold him into the perfect gentleman. While looking for a way to escape, Koichi finds a nearby payphone and uses Echo's ability to trick Yukako into contacting Josuk, which clues him and Okuyasu in on their location. As he attempts to survive Yukako's fury until Josuke arrives, Echo suddenly evolves into a new form, Echo's Act 2, which can turn the sound effects it writes into real actions when touched. Yukako endures several counterattacks from Act 2, but she is literally blown away onto a nearby cliff, which gives way underneath her. Just as Yukako falls toward some sharp rocks below, she is saved by bouncy sound effects already placed there by Koichi, turning them into harmless springs and as Koichi reunites with Josuke and Okuyasu, Yukako gains an all-new admiration for him since had saved her despite everything she had done to him. On their way to Kicho's grave, Josuke and Okuyasu come across an Italian restaurant called Trattoria Trasardi, run by chef Tonio Trasardi, who makes dishes based on the observations of his customers. Upon trying each of his dishes, Okuyasu experiences violent reactions within his body, such as his eyes being squeezed of their moisture and his teeth launching out, only to find they have ultimately benefited him by curing his various maladies. Growing suspicious, Josuke discovers that Tonio had been supplementing his dishes with his stand, Pearl Jam, and confronts him. After a brief scuffle, Josuke discovers that Tonio had only acted hostile towards him for not washing his hands before entering the kitchen and reveals that he simply wants to help his customers. He explains that he senses maladies his customers may be ailing from, and creates dishes that he infuses with Pearl Jam, which heals the customers' maladies and improves their health. Tonio then puts Josuke to work scrubbing the kitchen for his actions. Meanwhile, Jotaro meets with a representative of the Speedwagon Foundation, who informs him Joseph Joestar is on his way to Morio. Red Hot Chili Pepper challenges Josuke at home to see if he is strong enough to take on Jotaro and Star Platinum and despite Crazy Diamond's show of strength and speed, Chili Pepper shows off his own strength before retreating. The next day, Jotaro calls on Josuke, Okuyasu, and Koichi to inform them that Joseph, whose stand Hermit Purple can potentially detect Chili Pepper's user, is due to arrive at the port. Having heard the whole conversation, Chili Pepper appears from Okuyasu's motorcycle's battery and attempts to escape only to be stopped by Okuyasu. Despite being severely weakened, Chili Pepper goads him into attacking once more, unearthing an underground electrical cable which allows him to regain his strength. After cutting off Okuyasu's arm, Chili Pepper drags the rest of his body into the cable until Josuke uses Crazy Diamond on Okuyasu's severed arm, which takes his body away from Chili Pepper before he can be killed, and heals him. Jotaro and Okuyasu then head off to rendezvous with Joseph's ship while Josuke and Koichi stay on the docks, 
where they are confronted by Chili Pepper's user, Akira Otoishi who hides the stand in the underground wires to launch surprise attacks on Josuke from all directions, but Josuke turns the surrounding asphalt back into coal tar, allowing him to predict Chili Pepper's movements. Angered, Otoishi uses all the electricity in Morio Town to power Chili Pepper up, however, Josuke traps Chili Pepper in a tire and tricks him into bursting out, causing the air inside to blow him into the ocean. The combination of the ocean's size and the conductivity of saltwater caused Chili Pepper to dissolve but Otoishi survives and sneaks onto Joseph's boat disguised as a member of the Speedwagon Foundation. But Okuyasu stops him when he decides to punch both Otoishi and the real Speedwagon Foundation member, and Josuke finally meets Joseph. Jotaro retrieves the bow and arrow, and urges the others to be careful of any other stand users that might have been created and as Josuke tries to escort Joseph back to his house to meet Tomoko, Joseph finds an invisible baby girl who is a stand user. After buying a large amount of baby accessories with Josuke's credit card, Joseph attempts to add clothes and makeup to the baby to make her visible, only for her stand actung baby to activate when she starts crying, causing everything around her, including Joseph's hands, to turn invisible. As the baby gets more upset and her stand's powers strengthen, her stroller rolls away into a nearby river and Joseph slits open his wrist, using his blood to help Josuke find the baby before it drowns. Josuke becomes amazed by Joseph's self-sacrifice and regrets having seen him as nothing but a burden and he later learns that Joseph had spent nearly all of Josuke's savings on baby goods, when he discovers the sales receipt in Joseph's pocket. Upon discovering their mutual interest in the manga Pink Dark Boy, Hazamata brings Koichi to the home of its artist, Rohan Kishai, who gives them a tour of his studio. Koichi and Hazamata sneak a peek at Rohan's new manuscript but in the moment they do this, they fall under the power of Rohan's stand, Heaven's Door, which allows him to open their bodies like a book and read all of their secrets. After learning of Koichi's encounters with stand users, Rohan writes a safety lock in one of Koichi's pages, preventing from attacking him. He then proceeds to take pages from both Koichi and Hazamata as material for his manga, leaving them with no memory of what just happened. That night, Koichi senses something amiss when he discovers he has lost 20 kilograms, but suddenly forgets about it just as he prepares to inform Josuke. The next day, Koichi finds himself at Rohan's house again, with Josuke and Okuyasu following closely behind. As Rohan plans to keep taking pages from Koichi to inspire his manga works, the safety lock written inside Koichi prevents him from asking Josuke and Okuyasu for help. However, the two deduce what is happening from a wound on Koichi's hand and head inside Rohan's house who uses his manuscript to put Okuyasu under Heaven's Door's power, writing an instruction that will cause him to end his life if Josuke tries to help him. Josuke attacks Rohan directly, closing his eyes to prevent himself from viewing his manuscript and Rohan insults his hairstyle to provoke him into opening his eyes, but this backfires as Josuke loses sight of everything in his rage. As Josuke beats Rohan to a pulp. Koichi explains that when Josuke was four years old, around the same time Jotaro and Joseph fought Dale, he came down with a deadly fever and when he and Tomoko got stuck in a blizzard on their way to the hospital, a student with a regent hairstyle helped them get moving, inspiring Josuke to copy his hairstyle and take offense to anyone who insults it. Josuke, still in a rage, further beats up a surrendering Rohan and wrecks his studio. Jotaro brings Josuke along with him to track down a rat that had been turned into a stand user by Otoishi, teaching him how to fire ball bearings. During their search, the pair discover several rat corpses that had been melted from the inside and merged into a gelatinous flesh cube. Investigating an abandoned house, Josuke comes up against the rat, who had merged the home's owners in the same way. Withstanding Josuke's initial attack, the rat attacks with its stand, rat, before it succumbs to its injuries and dies while Jotaro encounters a second rat with the same ability, nicknamed Bug Eaton, which escapes out of the house. While pursuing him, Josuke falls into a trap that they had set up for the rats and gets hit by one of rat's needles, though is saved by Star Platinum's time-stopping ability. Jotaro then uses himself as bait to lure out Bug Eaton, tasking Josuke with pinpointing its location and shooting it with live rounds, and despite the pressure put on him by Jotaro's increasing injuries, Josuke lures Bug Eaton out into the open, allowing him to make the kill shot. 
Rohan brings Koichi along to investigate a mysterious alleyway not marked on the town map and as they go around corners, they keep finding themselves on the same street with a mailbox. They are then approached by a girl named Raimi Sugimoto, who reveals that both she and her dog Arnold are ghosts who were murdered 15 years ago. Explaining that the alleyway is a realm between the worlds of the living and the dead, Raimi informs Rohan and Koichi that the man who murdered her has been secretly killing others and asks them to stop him so that she can move on and after they agree, Raimi points them towards the exit, warning them not to turn around as they will be pulled into the afterlife by dark spirits. Just as they near the exit, the spirits trick Koichi into turning around, but Rohan gets both of them to safety with Heaven's Door. Afterwards, Rohan meets an old monk at Raimi's grave, who reveals that Rohan was once friends with Raimi, who had saved him from being murdered as well, meanwhile, a man named Yashikich Kira drives home with a woman's severed hand. Josuke and Okuyasu spot a group of hornet-shaped stands, known as Harvest, picking up loose change from under soda machines, ATMs, and mailboxes, and chase them back to their user, a middle school student named Shigechi Yengu. Learning how much money Shigechi made just from loose change, Josuke and Okuyasu strike up a business friendship with him, using Harvest to search for discarded stickers and vouchers that can be exchanged for larger cash rewards. However, things go sour when Shigechi greedily gives the duo only a small fraction of the money earned rather than splitting it 50 50ths. During their search, the boys find a winning lottery ticket with a 5 million yen jackpot, a prize that Shigechi is reluctant to share with Josuke and Okuyasu. The two and Shigechi go to the bank to collect the lottery reward, where the bank teller finds a name and number written on the back of the ticket. Just as the teller contacts the person written on the ticket, Josuke uses Crazy Diamond's power to change the name on the ticket, allowing the boys to successfully claim the promissory note for the prize. However, when Shigechi tries to claim the prize for himself, he sets his harvest after Josuke no Kuyasu when they try to stop him. As the two chase after him, he uses harvest to inject alcohol into their veins, causing them to become drunk and defenseless. Outnumbered by harvest, Okuyasu uses the lure of money to draw Shigechi close enough to take back the prize, which Josuke rips into shreds and sends into the wind in order to scatter harvest leaving Shigechi defenseless and after a beatdown and some heavy scolding from Josuke and Okuyasu, Shigechi agrees to split the money evenly between them. While downhearted over Koichi, Yukako comes across an esthetician named Ayasuji, who uses her stand, Cinderella, to remodel her face slightly so that Koichi will fall in love with her. Finding the treatment effective but temporary, Yukako undergoes a full-body treatment despite knowing of Aya's stand, which replaces entire parts of her body. After a moment of luck, Yukako manages to get a kiss from Koichi, who starts to fall in love with her, however, after forgetting to apply a lipstick that needed to be applied periodically, Yukako's modification starts to fall apart, leaving her without even her original face. When Koichi arrives, recognizing Yukako from her personality, Aya challenges her with picking her own face out of several copies she has made, with the wrong one doomed to leave her ugly forever, and as Yukako struggles to find her own face, she leaves the choice to Koichi, who offers to have Aya make him blind if he is wrong. Sensing Koichi's true love for Yukako, Aya, who had originally planned to trick them, allows him to pick the right face and restore Yukako to her original beauty. Kira goes with the severed hand of one of his victims to buy a sandwich, hiding it inside the shop's paper bag. Later, Shigechi picks up Kira's bag by mistake after a dog steals his and fearing that the police will trace the hand back to him if discovered. Kira tails Shigechi in the hopes of taking his bag before he can look inside. Following him into the gym at Shigechi's school, Kira is forced to hide when Josuke and Okuyasu show up to eat their lunch. He takes the bag but is discovered by Shigechi after he uses Harvest to search for it, leading to him discovering the hand and refusing to let Shigechi escape alive, Kira brings out his own stand, Killer Queen. He uses his stand ability to turn anything into a bomb, using a coin to deal heavy damage to Shigechi who attempts to reach Josuke, but Kira catches up to him, using a doorknob as a bomb to kill him, but in his final moments, Shigechi has Harvest bring Josuke a button that came off Kira's jacket. Having seen his soul pass by her realm, Raimi confirms to Josuke and the other allied stand users that Shigechi was killed by the same person who murdered her, whom they quickly realize is another stand user. 
A few days later, Jotaro and Koichi trace the button to a shoe shop where Kira's jacket is being repaired and just as the shop's owner attempts to reveal his customer's name, Kira kills him using Killer Queen's second bomb, sheer heart attack. Advising Koichi against recklessly chasing after the culprit, Jotaro goes up against sheer heart attack, which proves to be resilient to Star Platinum's attacks. Ignoring Jotaro's warning, Koichi sends Echoes to search for Kira, only to find he can control sheer heart attack from outside of Echo's range, leaving him open to an attack from it. Deducing that sheer heart attack uses body temperature to determine its primary target, Jotaro uses a fire to lure it away from Koichi, but gets critically injured by its amplified explosion. Thinking carefully, Koichi uses Echo's ability to distract it while he contacts Josuke and as Koichi is once again pursued, Echo's evolves into its third form. Echo's Act 3, using its new ability to increase sheer heart attack's weight and stop its movements. Feeling the weight of the attack on his left hand, Kira is forced to go off to retrieve his bomb. While Josuke and Okuyasu make their way to the scene, Kira appears before Koichi, knocking him out of Act 3's range and undoing the gravity on sheer heart attack. Taking advantage of Act 3's limitations, he brutally beats Koichi, who uses the opportunity to learn Kira's real name and just as he prepares to finish him off using Killer Queen, Jotaro stops Kira and pummels him with Star Platinum. As Josuke arrives with Okuyasu to heal Jotaro and Koichi, Kira, having failed to pass himself off as an innocent bystander, chops off his own hand to set sheer heart attack loose and escape, however, Using Crazy Diamond's ability to have it reunite with Kira's hand and try to rejoin his body, Josuke and the others follow it to Salon Cinderella. They discover Kira has killed Aya after forcing her to replace his face with another person, allowing him to take on a new identity and hide once again. Josuke and the others search through Kira's house, learning that he had been keeping a record of his toenail clippings since his murder of Raimi, and just then, a camera takes a picture of them containing the ghost of Kira's late father, Yoshihiro. Using his stand, Adam Hart father, Yoshihiro traps Josuke and Jotaro within the confines of the photograph, with any damage done to the photo dealt to them as well. Jotaro tricks Yoshihiro into taking a picture of himself, freeing them while trapping Yoshihiro inside a separate photograph but the latter tricks Okuyasu into setting him free, retrieving another arrow that Kira had in his possession as he makes his escape. Elsewhere, Kira begins living under the new identity of the man whose face he stole. Kosaku Kawajiri, moving into his house with his wife Shinobu and their son Hayato. Yoshihiro uses the arrow to make more stand-wielding allies, first using it on a boy named Ken Oyanagi who then pesters Rohan to play rock-paper-scissors with him, losing his first match after Rohan uses Heaven's Door to figure out his move. As Ken continues to force Rohan to play rock-paper-scissors with him and wins his third match, his stand, Boy 2 Man, appears and tries to suck in Heaven's Door. Rohan soon learns that Ken's stand allows him to steal energy from others and keep it if he wins three times out of five, discovering that he has already gained a third of Heaven's Door's ability. Ken then wins the fourth match, gaining more of Heaven's Door's ability and evening the score. Rohan wins his third match and retrieves Heaven's Door after borrowing Shizuka the Invisible Baby from Joseph and having her change what Ken attempted to throw out. Ken attempts to kill himself by jumping in front of a truck, but Rohan saves him, convincing him to stop using his stand for evil. Josuke and Okuyasu come across a peculiar person named Mikitaka Hazakura, who claims to be an alien named New Mikitakazonshi, and believing his claims to be a joke, Josuke initially suspects him of being a stand user when he exhibits some strange abilities. However, upon being distressed by the sound of sirens, Mikitaka suddenly transforms his body into a pair of sneakers and flees with Josuke, who suspects Mikitaka might not be a stand user as he cannot see Crazy Diamond. Looking to take advantage of Mikitaka's shape-shifting ability, Josuke has him transform into some dice and challenges Rohan to a game of CeeLo in the hopes of winning some money but as the match begins, Josuke grows worried when Mikitaka seems to get suspiciously ideal roles. Becoming aware of Josuke's winning streak, Rohan stabs his own finger while staking 2 million yen against Josuke's finger to determine how he is cheating, calling Kobayashi as an official to prevent Josuke from playing normally. Just as Mikitaka becomes unnerved by sirens and starts to lose his transformation, 
Rohan is distracted upon discovering he had accidentally set his house on fire, allowing Josuke to escape without being discovered. Meanwhile, Hayato uses hidden cameras to spy on Kira. The next day, while riding a bus through the Futatsumori tunnel with Josuke, Rohan spots a window to a room revealing a man cutting off a woman's hand, believing it to be Kira. Returning to the tunnel, Rohan discovers the room is an illusional trap and a nutrient-sucking stand named Highway Star attacks him. When Josuke comes to the tunnel, Highway Star tries to use Rohan to lure him into his room so he can track his scent but as Josuke ignores Rohan's warnings and enters the room, he sends him flying out of the tunnel, urging him to flee from Highway Star and find the stand user. Believing there is a connection between Highway Star's user and the tunnel, Josuke contacts Koichi, who suspects the user is someone hospitalized from a traffic accident stealing nutrients to heal himself and while Josuke makes his way to the hospital while keeping ahead of Highway Star, Koichi identifies the stand user as Yuya Fungami. Despite being caught by Highway Star upon reaching Yuya's room, Josuke recovers his nutrients with an four drip and heals Yuya's injuries so he can mercilessly pummel him without any guilt. Meanwhile, at the Kawajiri household, Shinobu finds a cat hanging around the basement. Upon discovering the cat has a hole in its throat, Shinobu sends Kira down to the basement after being unable to force the cat out and learns she accidentally killed the cat when it got stabbed by glass shards. After being buried in the garden, the cat reincarnates as a strange plant known as Stray Cat, gradually piecing together what happened while learning it can manipulate compressed air. Stray Cat attempts to get revenge on Shinobu with Kira nearly getting himself killed but he appeals to Stray Cat's feline nature, and hides it in the attic after seeing its potential use to him. The next day, Hayato is attacked by Stray Cat when he exposed it to sunlight while investigating the attic until he put Stray Cat back to sleep and hides before being discovered by Kira, realizing the man is not his real father. Yoshihiro, recognizing Kira in his new appearance, notices he is being followed by Hayato. Later, on July 15, Josuke and Okuyasu come across Mikitaka, who spots a stand user named Toyohiro Kanadachi living on an electrical pylon and when Josuke spots Yoshihiro with him, he steps inside it and falls under the spell of Kanadachi's stand, Superfly, becoming trapped inside until someone else takes his place. Josuke and Okuyasu attempt to destroy the pylon, only to discover it reflects out any damage it receives. Wanting to help, Mikitaka confronts Kanadachi, helping Josuke to escape but becoming trapped himself. Meanwhile, as something troubling happens in the Higashikata household, Rohan, who had noticed Hayato's behavior, is approached by a strange man. He is greeted by Masaso Kanoto, an architect sent to evaluate the damages done to his house, using Heaven's Door to find nothing suspicious besides an aversion to people looking at his back. Meanwhile, Josuke climbs up the pylon to rescue Mikitaka and confront Kanadachi, who uses calculative cuts on the pylon to attack Josuke from all angles. Josuke uses Crazy Diamond's healing ability to send the bolts of energy back to their origin and defeat Kanadachi. And after resigning himself to stay inside the pylon, Kanadachi reveals that he heard Yoshihiro say that another stand user has allegedly eliminated Koichi. Enlisting Yuya's help in tracking Koichi's scent in exchange for healing his injuries, Josuke encounters the stand user, Teranosuk Miyamoto, who suddenly disappears and is replaced by an unconscious Tomoko. Unbeknownst to Josuk, Miyamoto had used his stand Enigma to turn Koichi and Tomoko into pieces of paper after witnessing their ticks when they are afraid, and is now waiting to observe Josuk's tick. Overcome by his curiosity, Rohan lays a trap for Kanoto so he can see his back and the moment he does, Kanoto dies from his back ripping open as his self-aware stand cheap trick attaches to Rohan's back and proceeds to hassle Rohan into burning the Kira suspect photos. Meanwhile, Miyamoto reveals that he has trapped Koichi in a piece of paper and traps Josuke after goading him into biting his lower lip. Despite initially not wanting to get involved, Yuya is moved by Josuke's resolve and goes after Miyamoto, encountering several paper-hidden traps that eventually culminates in a shredder that threatens to shred both Josuke and Koichi. Even after being overcome by fear and falling under Enigma's power, Yuya takes advantage of his paper-like state to reach into the shredder and free Josuke and Koichi, and after receiving a pummeling from a vengeful Josuke, Miyamoto is trapped in the form of a book which Josuke later donates to the library. Unable to get Koichi to take him seriously without risking either of their lives, 
Rohan attempts to reach the Morio Grand Hotel without letting anyone see his back despite Cheap Trick's antics. Cheap Trick attempts to get several cats and dogs to attack Rohan and see his back, only for the animals to be shooed off by Koichi as he eventually believes Rohan's story. Koichi tries removing Cheap Trick using Echo's Act 3, only to discover that doing so will damage Rohan's back as well and despite appearing to have gone insane as he shows his back to Koichi, Rohan reveals they are in Ghost Alley with Cheap Trick dragged away by the spectral hands with Rohan hoping the stand ends up in hell. Meanwhile, Hayato witnesses Kira killing a couple with his ability and catches it on film, something that Kira is quick to notice as he confronts Hayato and prepares to kill him, only for the boy to reveal he has set up various cameras and videotapes that would threaten to expose his identity if Kira attempts to kill him or his mother. An infuriated Kira inadvertently kills Hayato in a manner that would not look like an accident while Yoshihiro appears and reveals that Rohan and the others now consider Kosaku Kawajiri a suspect and plan to visit. Yoshihiro's arrow senses Kira's anxiety and impales him of its own will, entering his body while giving Killer Queen a new ability. The next morning, Hayato appears alive and well, believing he had a nightmare of being killed while noting Kira being strangely confident enough to reveal his true name as the man indirectly reveals the other stand user's existence. While Hayato is on his way to school, Rohan reads his memories with Heaven's Door, ignoring a warning as he reads events that occur within seconds before reaching the page revealing Kira's identity. Rohan falls victim to the bomb Kira implanted in Hayato, bites the dust, which kills anyone who learns about Kira's identity through Hayato. As Rohan explodes, Hayato suddenly finds himself sent back in time to an hour earlier due to Bites the Dust's effects and realizes he is trapped in a time loop. Hayato attempts to keep his distance from Rohan, but Kira, deducing that Hayato was already subjected to Bites the Dust, explains how he used his stand's new ability to avert his death and make him the means of getting rid of his pursuers. Kira also reveals that anyone killed by his stand's ability in the previous time loop still dies and that cancelling the ability after such a death makes the event permanent, with Hayato forced to watch Rohan still explode. He tries to avoid Josuk, Jotaro, Koichi, and Okuyasu when they arrive, but his forced life-ending attempt is prevented by Killer Queen as he set up bites the dust. Ending up back in his room at 7.30 am, Hayato realizes the only way of saving Josuk's group and his mother is by killing Kira or forcing him to cancel Bites the Dust before Rohan's death. He hides Stray Cat while intending to use his knowledge of events to catch Kira off guard, but the latter protects himself from Stray Cat's attack with a watch he had put in his jacket earlier. Hayato secretly calls Josuke to arrive a bit early while tricking Kira into exposing himself as a murderer which forces Kira to cancel Bites the Dust in time to protect himself from Josuk, with Rohan's life saved as Okuyasu arrives. Despite being outmatched, Kira takes advantage of Hayato bringing Stray Cat and places it in Killer Queen's body so his stand can create invisible remote bombs with Okuyasu taking heavy damage. Josuke tries to reach and heal him, but Hayato deduces that Kira turned him into a bomb with Josuke conflicted over sacrificing himself to save Okuyasu. Deducing that Kira can only set off one bomb at a time, Hayato sets off the bomb on himself and Josuke quickly restores him and heals Okuyasu who seems to have died. Josuke refuses to accept his death and uses Crazy Diamond on the road debris in his wounds to dodge Kira's air bomb as he and Hayato retreats into a nearby house with Kira deeming Josuke as a true threat to himself. Kira figures out Josuke's location in the house while the latter is badly wounded after being caught in an explosion. However, Josuke uses his hardened blood on a vase fragment to turn it into a homing bullet that hits the area on Kira's body with his blood on it. Josuke then notices Kira using a cell phone and realizes Yoshihiro had been hiding in Hayato's pocket to relay their position and tricks Kira into killing Yoshiro with an explosion that attracts his attention. Josuke then draws Kira into a close quarters fight, but Stray Cat protects him from Crazy Diamond's attacks. While Josuke is about to be hit by an air bomb, Okuyasu suddenly appears and snatches Stray Cat from Killer Queen and Kira is driven into a corner as Jotaro and the others arrive alongside emergency vehicles responding to the explosions. Surrounded by ambulances and fire engines, 
Kira attempts to use bites the dust on an approaching nurse in a last-ditch attempt to kill everyone and avert events but finds himself in Ghost Alley and Raimi reintroducing herself after having Kira remember that he died from being crushed under a moving ambulance after Koichi and Jotaro prevented him from triggering bites the dust. Kira realizes he is in Ghost Alley, but is forced to look back when Arnold bites off his hand and he is torn to pieces while dragged away by the spectral hands. No longer bound to her attachments, Raimi and Arnold bid farewell to everyone before moving on to the next life and the next day, Jotaro and Joseph return home with Josuke seeing them off as the summer of 1999 ends. In 2001, two years after Yashikage Kira's defeat, Koichi Hirose arrives in Naples, Italy at the request of Jotaro Kujo to obtain a skin sample from a young man Hirono Shiobana. Koichi ends up being scammed by Hirono, who now goes by the name of Giorno Giovanna. While escaping from Koichi, Giorno uses his stand gold experience, which allows him to transform inanimate objects into living organisms, to transform Koichi's luggage into a frog. Giorno then has an altercation with a gangster named Leaky I Luca for operating on his turf. Luca attempts to bash Giorno's head in with a shovel, but instead strikes the frog, which results in Luca taking the damage and being knocked out. Later, Koichi catches up to Giorno and tries to restrain him with his stand echoes, only for Giorno to escape by using gold experience to create a tree that raises him to safety. Koichi reports his findings to Jotaro and learns that Giorno is Dio Brando's son. Giorno boards a cable car and encounters Bruno Bacciarati who suspects Giorno of harming Luca, who was later killed by his boss. Bacciarati brings out the power of his zipper generating stand, sticky fingers, to extract the truth from Giorno. In a flashback, it is revealed that Giorno, who was once abused by his stepfather and bullied by other kids, began being treated with respect after saving an injured gangster, giving him a reason to live. Back in the present, faced with Bacciarati's stand, sticky fingers, Giorno desperately uses gold experience to defend himself and learns his stand can cause a living person's senses to go berserk. Outmatched, Bacciarati creates a dimension-distorting zipper in an attempt to hide himself inside another person, but Giorno tracks him down by turning a tooth he had earlier punched out from Bacciarati's mouth into a fly that attempts to return to his body. Given the chance to finish Bacciarati off, Giorno decides against it and instead asks to join his organization. He reveals his goal to take down the organization's boss and rule over it himself so he may better the lives of the citizens of Naples. Bacciarati agrees to introduce Giorno into the Passione organization, but he has to be evaluated by Palpo, a morbidly obese capo. Giorno visits him in prison and realizes that he is a stand user. Palpo tasks him with keeping the flame on a cigarette lighter burning for 24 hours as a test of his trust. Giorno arrives back at his dorm with it but he is forced to evade Koichi, who has come looking for his passport. The lighter is accidentally doused by a janitor who easily reignites the it, however, this causes Palpo's stand Black Sabbath to appear as it grabs the janitor's soul and pierces it with an arrow to test if it is worthy. The janitor is killed, and Black Sabbath turns its attention to Giorno who after evading the attacks, deduces that the stand attacks those who witnessed the lighter being relit while staying in the shadows to avoid sunlight. Koichi is also targeted. As he had also witnessed the lighter and deduces that Black Sabbath is a remote type stand while recognizing its arrow as the same type that created his stand. Black Sabbath traps Giorno by reaching out from within the shadow of a tree and Koichi tries to restrain it by pinning it down, pushing him far enough down to contact the tree's roots. Giorno uses gold experience to wither the tree, exposing Black Sabbath to the sunlight and causing it to vanish. The next day, Giorno visits Palpo and is admitted into the Passione. However, angry that Palpo had killed the janitor, Giorno turns one of Palpo's guns into a banana, causing the capo to accidentally kill himself when he tries to eat it. Koichi respects Giorno's wishes not to inform Jotaro of what happened, keeping Giorno's plan secret and later, Bacciarati takes Giorno to meet the rest of his stand-wielding team. News of Palpo's apparent suicide reaches many Passione members, along with the suspicion that Bacciarati knows the location of Palpo's hidden fortune. Meanwhile, Giorno is introduced to Bacciarati's group, Leona Baccio, Narancia Gerga, Guido Mista, and Panicata Fugo. After learning of Palpo's death, 
Bucciarati takes his team on a yacht to the island of Capri to retrieve Palpo's fortune and attain the rank of Capo. Narancia, Mista and Fugo mysteriously vanish, leading Bucciarati to suspect someone has sneaked onto the yacht and is targeting him for the fortune. Giorno deduces that the others are still alive and acts as bait to lure out the enemy stand, prompting Abaccio, who initially distrusted Giorno, to bring out his own stand. A flashback details Abaccio's past. He was once an honest police officer until his career ended when he accepted a bribe from a thug, who then went on to kill Abaccio's partner. He later joined Passione after being approached by Bacciarati. Back in the present, Abaccio uses his stand Moody Blues to replay the last five minutes of Narancia's actions. Abaccio and Bacciarati deduce that the enemy stand, Soft Machine, has the power to deflate opponents like balloons and pull them into small spaces. Abaccio suspects that there is one more mystery behind Soft Machine's power, and allows himself to be captured as well, leaving Bacciarati a trail of blood showing where the stand user is hiding. Bacciarati floods the yacht and causes it to sink, forcing the stand user, Mario Zucchero, to emerge. Zucchero is revealed to have been hiding inside a second yacht which he had deflated with his power and laid over the first. Bacciarati incapacitates Zucchero by unzipping his head from his body, rescuing the others in the process. Bacciarati's gang takes some delight in torturing information out of Zucchero despite little success. Abaccio then uses Moody Blue's replay to discover that Zucchero's partner is already waiting for their boat on Capri. Giorno takes Mista on ahead to the island to find Zucchero's partner before their boat arrives. With help from Giorno, Mista uses the power of his stand sex pistols, which creates six autonomous bullet-like beings that can redirect Mista's gunshots mid-flight, to locate Zucchero's partner named Sale. Sale escapes to a getaway truck, and Mista grabs on before it drives away. In a flashback, Mista is shown as a carefree young thug who discovered that bullets fired at him miss completely. Back on the island of Capri, Mista is hanging onto the truck traveling up a mountain and is confronted by Sale and his stand, Kraftwerk. Sale's stand allows him to affix objects and people in place, which enables him to stop a bullet fired by Mista from penetrating his skull. Mista then uses his sex pistols to knock Sale off the truck however. Sale catches up to Mista and hits him with one of his own bullets. Sale attempts to finish Mista off with one final bullet, but Mista has the sex pistols take control of it and split it in two, deflecting a fragment to push the bullet Sale had previously stopped further into his skull. Mista then has the truck driver return him to the marina where he enters the watch house with the bleeding Sale. Bacciarati's group are reunited on Capri and are approached by Pericolo, one of Passione's capos disguised as a janitor. Bacciarati hands over the treasure, which was hidden inside a urinal, and Pericolo names Bacciarati a capo in control of Palpo's turf. His first task is to protect Trishuna, daughter of Passione's mysterious boss, from a hitman team within the organization that has turned traitor and seeks to learn the boss's identity so they can depose him. Back in Naples, Formaggio, one of the traders, manages to locate Narancia while he is shopping for supplies. He engages Narancia and concludes that Bacciarati's group must be guarding Trish. Narancia tries to dispose of Formaggio with his miniature airplane stand Aerosmith, but Formaggio uses his own stand. Little feet to shrink himself and hide in Narancia's pocket. Narancia discovers that he is slowly shrinking due to a wound little feet had inflicted on him. When Formaggio prevents him from using a public telephone to call Bacciarati's group, Narancia realizes Formaggio is nearby. Narancia uses Aerosmith to relentlessly track Formaggio and forces him down into the sewer. In a flashback to two years earlier, the Hitman team realized that two of their members, Sorbet and Gelato, were missing after trying to discover the boss's identity. Formaggio found Gelato dead with a note reading, Punishment, and later the team was anonymously mailed frames holding Sorbet's dismembered remains. The group consequently abandoned their plans for advancement until they learnt of Trish. Back in the present, Formaggio deduces that Aerosmith detects its targets by their CO2 emittance. Formaggio attempts to escape among a group of rats, only to become the target of Aerosmith yet again due to the heavy breathing of the rat he is riding. 
He survives an attack by reverting to his original size, as Aerosmith has also shrunk along with Narancia and its smaller bullets have little effect. A flashback shows that after Narancia's mother died from an eye infection and he ran away from home due to his father's neglect. Falling into a bad crowd, he was arrested after his friend framed him, then was abandoned by his friends after being released. He nearly died from the same eye infection that killed his mother, but he was rescued by Fugo and Bacciarati. Formaggio traps the miniature Narancia in a bottle with a spider to interrogate him on Trisha's whereabouts. However, Aerosmith had earlier riddled a car with bullets, and the car suddenly explodes, scorching Formaggio and returning Narancia to his normal size. Formaggio shrinks himself, using his own blood to extinguish the flames engulfing him, and attempts to escape under the smoke affecting Aerosmith's radar. However, Narancia causes more explosions, surrounding Formaggio with more fires and forcing him to reveal himself. The two have one final standoff, resulting in Narancia killing Formaggio. Back at the vineyard, Bucciarati receives instructions from the boss to travel to Pompeii and retrieve a key near a dog mosaic for a vehicle which can escort Trish to safety. Giorno, Fugo, and Abaccio arrive in Pompeii seeking the key. They come across a strange mirror and Fugo is suddenly dragged into a mirror world by Hitman team member Eluso and his stand, Man in the Mirror. Fugo summons his stand, Purple Haze, but it appears in the real world with Giorno and Abaccio instead of the mirror world where he is trapped. A flashback explains how Fugo's pent-up rage led to a violent incident that led him to be disowned by his family and for him to eventually join Bacciarati's group. As Purple Haze begins to emit a deadly virus from its fists, Fugo has it smash the mirror as a message for Giorno who remains determined to save Fugo, despite Abaccio's command that they find the key and flee. Abaccio attempts to retrieve the key, but Eluso uses a nearby piece of a mirror to draw him into the mirror world. Abaccio tricks Eluso into taking Moody Blues into the mirror, but the latter counterattacks, leaving half of Abaccio and Moody Blues in each world, rendering each powerless. In desperation, Abaccio cuts off his own hand, enabling Moody Blue's hand to grab and deliver the key to Giorno. However, rather than flee with the key, Giorno allows himself to be dragged into the mirror world by Eluso. Giorno reveals he had infected himself with Purple Haze's virus, and has now passed it on to Eluso. To save himself, Eluso escapes back into the real world, leaving his infected arm in the mirror world. However, Giorno had earlier used gold experience to turn a brick into a snake which tracks Eluso's position, enabling Fugo to follow and kill him with Purple Haze. As Eluso dies, Fugo, Abaccio and Giorno return to the real world, where Giorno uses the snake's antibodies to cure his own infection before tasking Fugo with treating Abaccio's wounds. Bacciarati's gang follows the key's instructions to drive to Naples railway station to find the vehicle it unlocks, and to use the vehicle to bring Trish to Venice. Meanwhile, two members of the Hitman team, Prosciutto and Pesci, arrive at the station to ambush Bacciarati's squad. Unable to unlock any keyholes he finds at the specified location written on the key, Bacciarati notices a land turtle named Coco Jumbo with a key-shaped indentation in its shell. He and his crew board the train with the turtle and insert the key into its shell. This activates its stand ability, Mr. President, which pulls them into a furnished room inside its body. When Prosciutto and Pesci board the train, they are unable to locate the others as Coco Jumbo is hiding under a chair, keeping Bacciarati's crew safe and in order to find them, Prosciutto activates his stand, the Grateful Dead, which spreads a gas throughout the train that causes everyone to rapidly age. Although the turtle is barely affected by the gas, Narancia, Fugo and Giorno quickly age. Giorno notices that Bacciarati, Mista, and Trish are aging slower than the others and seeing that they each have cool drinks, he deduces that the aging gas is less effective on those with cooler body temperatures. Mista exits the turtle to find the stand user, but when he tries to turn on the air conditioning to cool the room, he is immediately hooked by Pesci's fishing rod stand, Beach Boy, which was using the machine's button as bait. Beach Boy's hook makes its way through Mista's body towards his brain. Mista has sex pistols find Pesci and shatter the ice he is using to keep cool and prevent the Grateful Dead's effect. Panicking, Pesci drops his grip on Mista and exposes his location, but a disguised prosciutto, 
having aged himself with his stand, launches a surprise attack on Mista and he instantly ages him before firing three bullets into his head, leaving him for dead. Prosciutto and Pesci then head to the driver's cabin where they find Coco Jumbo. However, Mista is still alive thanks to his sex pistols stopping the bullets from penetrating his skull, and he sends pistol number 6 to deliver an ice cube to Bacciarati. This allows Bacciarati to launch a counterattack against Prosciutto however, his movements warm him up and increase the aging effect. Prosciutto grabs him, but Bacciarati quickly zips open the cabin and drags both himself and Prosciutto off the moving train to protect his crew. Pesci catches Prosciutto with Beach Boy's line, but Bacciarati uses the opportunity to grab onto the line himself and knock Prosciutto off the train. However, Prosciutto survives and gets caught under the train's carriage, causing the Grateful Dead to remain in effect. As Bacciarati makes his way back on board the train, Pesci becomes emboldened by Prosciutto's sacrifice, shedding his cowardice and becoming ruthless. Pesci has Beach Boy travel through Bacciarati's body in an attempt to pierce his heart. In order to save himself, Bacciarati remains still and uses sticky fingers to split himself up into pieces, even splitting his heart in half so that Pesci can't find him. Giving up on his search, Pesci stops the train, giving Bacciarati time to revive himself and piece himself back together. Bacciarati emerges from the stop train and faces Pesci. While the latter nearly manages to pierce Bacciarati's heart, Sticky Fingers grabs Beach Boy's line and uses it to twist Pesci's neck. In his last moments, Pesci attempts to crush Coco Jumbo with the crew still inside, but Bacciarati stops him by unzipping his own arm so it can punch Pesci, then finishes him off by zipping him into pieces. Prosciutto also succumbs to his wounds and dies, causing everyone to revert to normal. In the aftermath of the fight, Bacciarati discovers that Trish has stand powers she is unaware of and the team is soon trailed by their next opponent, Meloni. Meloni finds a sample of Bacciarati's blood on the train and using his Stan baby face and the genetic information of a woman on the train, he spawns a remote-controlled baby Stan. Bacciarati's crew stop on the roadside and prepare to steal a car while baby face Jr. tracks them down on Meloni's motorcycle using Bacciarati's DNA. Using its ability to chop up and reconstruct humans, baby face Jr. captures Bacciarati and Trish inside Coco Jumbo. To stop Giorno from telling the others, it begins removing parts of Giorno's body who then uses gold experience to replace the missing parts of his body and turns gold experience's hand into a piranha which attacks baby face Jr. from the inside. Giorno tricks him into merging with Meloni's motorcycle, then uses the spark plug to ignite the gasoline and cause an explosion, destroying him and returning Bacciarati and Trish to normal. He then uses Babyface Jr.'s components to create a poisonous snake which tracks down and kills Maloney. Bacciarati's gang then finds instructions to use Moody Blues to receive the boss's final orders. Moody Blues transforms into Pericolo who, having been speaking to no one, had planned this method to ensure the orders couldn't be intercepted. Pericolo said to recover a data disk at Venice Station which contains further instructions, then killed himself to keep the information secret. Giorno and Mista drive towards Venice while the others remain in Coco Jumbo, however, Giaccio, another Hitman team member, catches up with their car and attacks them using the freezing ability of his Stand White album. They manage to shake him off by combining their Stand's abilities, but Giaccio catches up again and uses his Stand as both armor and ice skates. In a desperate move to defeat Giaccio, Giorno drives their car into a canal. White album's ice surrounds the car in the canal, but Giorno manages to transform some car parts into grass for Mista to use as a makeshift snowboard. Giaccio attempts to stop him by temporarily unfreezing the canal, but Giorno reverts the grass into car parts again so that Mista can fire a metal projectile into Giaccio's forehead. However, Giaccio's armor is bulletproof, excepting a small breathing hole on the back of his neck. Mista attempts to shoot into the hole, but Giaccio uses an ability he calls White Album gently weeps to freeze parts of the air solid, causing the bullet to ricochet until eventually hitting Mista's chest. Giaccio finds a statue which contains the data disc and shatters it. Giorno inspires Mista to allow himself to be shot by his own ricocheting bullets, this allows him to use his blood to block Giaccio's vision and force him onto a broken lamppost, impaling him through the neck. 
Giacho attempts to protect himself by freezing his blood while also reflecting a bullet towards Mista's head, but Giorno steps in, immediately heals Mista's wound, and forces Giacho further onto the metal with repeated kicks, killing him, then heals Mista's injuries. Bucciarati's crew arrives in Venice and read the final mission from the boss on the data disc. The instructions are for only one person to take Trish to the top of the bell tower of the church on the island of San Giorgio Maggiore. Bucciarati takes Trish ashore, but also wears one of Giorno's ladybug brooches as a tracking device while the others wait in their speedboat. Bucciarati and Trish ascend in the tower's elevator. But when they arrive at the top, Bucciarati discovers that Trish has disappeared and that he is only holding her severed hand. Bucciarati has a flashback to his youth when he first joined Passione and realizes that the boss intends to kill his daughter to protect his own identity. Bucciarati follows the boss and manages to attach Giorno's ladybug tracker to him before he detacks the boss and reconnects Trish's hand, but the boss uses his stand King Crimson to erase time and effortlessly avoid Bucciarati's attacks. Having appeared behind Bucciarati, King Crimson pushes his fist all the way through Bucciarati's chest in an attempt to kill him. Back on the boat, Bucciarati's crew wait for their leader while Giorno tracks the boss by following the ladybug. However, Giorno realizes that the group is experiencing a race time, with none of them remembering what had happened in between. Meanwhile, inside the church, Bucciarati lies bleeding from King Crimson's attack. Just as the boss is about to kill Trish, he is suddenly encased within a turtle made by Giorno's gold experience that replicates Coco Jumbo's stand ability. Bucciarati drops the turtle through the floor into an underground stream. However, King Crimson quickly reappears and prepares to attack again. But Bucciarati uses his remaining energy to grab Trish and use sticky fingers to lift them both to the floor above. Giorno finds them and heals Bucciarati, while Bucciarati's body appears to be deceased for a few seconds, he eventually begins moving again. Giorno signals the others, who arrive before King Crimson can reach Giorno and Bucciarati. The boss determines that he cannot fight them all without revealing his identity and decides to withdraw, allowing them to escape with Trish. On the dock, Bucciarati pierces his hand on a metal spike but doesn't react in pain, confusing Giorno. Bucciarati explains his decision to protect Trish, and gives his crew the choice of following him or the organization. One by one they join him, with the exception of Fugo. While Bucciarati's remaining crew stops for lunch, Narancia accidentally splashes red wine onto a man's white suit. When the man demands compensation, the paranoid crew members think he is an enemy and savagely beat him up. Meanwhile, Trish reveals that her father's origins are in Sardinia and they decide to travel there after leaving Venice. While eating, Narancia finds the metallic fish stand clash in his soup, it suddenly attacks him, biting off his tongue and rendering him speechless. He sees that Clash is able to teleport between nearby bodies of liquid, but he is unable to warn the others. After Giorno replaces Narancia's tongue, Narancia starts giving them false information, forced to do so by the stand talking head which has latched itself onto the base of his new tongue. The group are observed from afar by Squalo and Tiziano, Clash and talking head's respective users and members of the boss's elite guard squad. While the others try to figure out what is happening with Narancia, he directs them into a washroom where he tries to remove all traces of liquid, even his blood, to stop Clash from reappearing. Just as the others leave the room, a leaking pipe enables Clash to emerge from a puddle on the floor and attack Giorno, biting him on the neck. Squalo uses Clash to teleport Giorno to various water sources, making it difficult for Narancia to keep up. Giorno allows Narancia to shoot him with Aerosmith so the gun residue can make it easier to track Clash allowing Narancia to wound Squalo. Squalo and Tiziano get the upper hand by using Narancia to lead the rest of Bucciarati's crew into a kitchen with a gas leak and forcing Narancia to tell Mista to shoot with sex pistols, causing an explosion. But with the rest of the crew incapacitated, Narancia runs into the streets to track down Squalo and Tiziano by himself. He cuts out his own tongue containing talking head and replaces it with one of Giorno's ladybug brooches, causing Tiziano to panic and drastically change his breathing patterns. This allows Narancia to locate and open fire on him with Aerosmith. 
Tiziano sacrifices himself to give Squalo a chance to attack by providing a nearby body of liquid for Clash to teleport to being his blood. Squalo has Clash bite Narancia's throat, but the latter withstands Clash's attack and kills Squalo too. With the two enforcers defeated, Bucciarati's crew head out of the Venice canals towards the airport to catch a plane to Sardinia. The group manages to secure an airplane after escaping Venice, with Abaccio using Moody Blues to fly the plane by replaying its pilot. As they prepare to leave, a hostile stand user named Karn approaches them on the runway, but Mista shoots and kills him and during the flight, Giorno discovers that Karn's stand notorious B.I.G., a flesh-eating blob, has activated after his death and has attached itself to Giorno's right arm. Mista shoots Giorno's arm off, but notorious B.I.G., which tracks its foes by their movement and then absorbs their energy, attacks the sex pistols, severely injuring Mista. Narancia attacks with Aerosmith, but he too is targeted and injured by Notorious B.I.G., deeming it to be indestructible. Giorno forces it to latch onto his remaining left arm, then manages to dispose of it by severing his arm and sending it out of the plane. Since Gold Experience's powers come from its fists, Giorno can neither fight nor heal the wounds of himself. Mista or Narancia. Bacciarati relays the attack to Abaccio and takes the wounded inside the turtle. Alone, Trish is approached by Notorious B.I.G., which was chasing the quickest moving object nearby, that being the plane itself. The stand doesn't pursue her when she remains still, instead approaching one of Giorno's throbbing brooches, which is in the process of transforming into one of Giorno's hands. Trish realizes that Giorno had created a brooch replicating one of his hands before cutting his arm off, which when attached could allow him, Mista and Narancia to recover. Trish tries to acquire Giorno's brooch without attracting Notorious B.I.G., but it attacks her. Trish unintentionally awakens her Stan Spice Girl, who explains that it has the ability to make any surface softer and rubber-like. Spice Girl tricks Notorious into repeatedly attacking a ticking clock that it renders elastic, making it indestructible. While it's distracted, Spice Girl slowly but firmly pierces the stand with a pipe, causing it to evaporate. Finally safe, Trish returns to the cockpit and informs Bacciarati of Notorious B.I.G.'s attack, but a portion of it managed to travel through the wall and attack the engine in the rear of the plane causing it to grow massive and fill up half of the interior of the airplane. Trish uses Spice Girl to turn the cockpit of the plane into a makeshift parachute while Notorious and the rest of the airplane crash into the Tyrrhenian Sea. Notorious B.I.G. remains trapped in the ocean due to the constantly moving waves, and thanks to Giorno's hand in his brooch, Giorno is able to heal himself and the others, and they arrive on Sardinia undetected. However, the boss senses that they survived and that Trish has awakened her stand, fearing that she may recall her youth at Costa Smeralda. He decides to travel to Sardinia alone to prevent anyone from discovering his identity. In the summer of 1965, a Sardinian woman in an Italian prison gave birth to a boy which was then taken in by the church under the care of a friendly priest. One night the priest found the boy's mother underneath concrete at the church, buried but still alive, and deemed that she had been there for years. The boy caught the priest in the act and soon after, the entire village burned down as the list of the dead included the priest and the boy. In the present on Sardinia, the boy, still a teenager years later, encounters a mysterious fortune teller. The man determines that the boy is looking for his 15-year-old daughter, but is confused due to his own apparent age. The fortune teller then begs to see the boy's palm to read deeper into his fortune until he suddenly snaps and physically transforms into an adult. Grabbing the fortune teller by the throat who realizes that he has two personalities, light and dark, with the older personality in truth being Passion's boss. From a photograph, the fortune teller predicts the boss will soon meet the traitor Risotto Nero, the leader of the Hitman team. King Crimson then appears, swiftly executing the fortune teller. The boss reverts to the teenager, named Dapio, who travels to Costa Smeralda and when the boss needs to speak to and control Dapio. He hallucinates a phone ringing and speaks through miscellaneous objects, believing them to be cell phones. Dapio is discovered by Risotto, who realizes that he is a stand user when he reacts to the sound of Aerosmith scouting the area, which signifies the arrival of Bacciarati's team. Risotto uses his stand Metallica to create razor blades and steel needles which puncture Dapio from the inside out. 
While Risotto prepares another attack, the boss calls Doppio and tells him to get within 2 meters of Risotto. Which will allow him to swiftly take control of their shared body and kill Risotto with King Crimson before he can discover his true identity. In order to help with this, the boss lends Doppio a portion of his power, which he calls Epitaph to predict Risotto's movements by glancing 10 seconds into the future. With Epitaph's power, Doppio sees a vision of a pair of scissors piercing out of his throat. Unable to avoid this from happening, Doppio quickly clasps his throat and removes the scissors. He deduces Risotto's ability to transform the iron in his body into metallic objects, as well as the ability for Risotto to cloak his own visibility with iron. Next, Doppio sees a vision of a severed foot and, sensing Risotto's direction, throws the scissors and cuts off Risotto's foot. Risotto, now aware of Doppio's precognitive abilities, reattaches his severed foot with metal staples while noting Doppio's two different personalities. Risotto presses his attack, transforming more iron from Doppio's body into objects, the loss of iron from his body not only weakens Doppio, but it also reduces his body's ability to absorb oxygen, leaving him short of breath. Risotto prepares to finish off Doppio, slowly coming to the realization of the identity of Doppio's second personality. However, scalpels that Doppio had earlier attempted to throw at Risotto ended up flying in the direction of Bacciarati's group attracting their attention. Risotto is suddenly shot from behind by Aerosmith, which can only detect his breathing. The boss takes control of Doppio's body and explains his plan to Risotto. Fatally wounded, he realizes that Doppio's other personality is the boss and uses his last bit of strength to grab the boss and attempt to trick Aerosmith into shooting the both of them, but King Crimson erases the time in which the bullets were shot to avoid them, killing Risotto. The boss eats a nearby frog to regain some iron as Bacciarati and Narancia head to the scene of the battle. Abaccio uses Moody Blues to search through the past on the Costa Smeralda beach, trying to recreate the boss's face. Bacciarati and Narancia see Risotto's corpse, then unexpectedly find a young boy tied behind a rock and missing blood, with his lips sewn together. Back on the beach, Abaccio is distracted by a group of young soccer players trying to retrieve their ball from a tree. When he goes to help them, he is mortally wounded by the boss, who impersonated one of the young boys. In the afterlife, Abaccio reunites with his deceased partner from the police force, who commends him for his diligence in helping his friends. When Bacciarati's group come across Abaccio's corpse, Giorno discovers that just before Moody Blues disappeared forever. Abaccio used it to successfully recreate a death mask of the boss's face in a nearby stone pillar. Bacciarati and Giorno search police and Interpol databases for a face that matches the one that Abaccio created, without success. However, a voice within their laptop informs them that the boss's name is Diavolo and that King Crimson is unbeatable, except possibly by using a stand arrow which they can collect from the voice's owner in Rome. The voice tells them the history of the stand arrows, they were created from a meteorite which crashed in Greenland and house a virus which kills most but gives people superhuman abilities if they survive its effects. Convinced the offer is genuine, Bacciarati agrees to meet the person behind the voice at the Colosseum. Meanwhile, Diavolo reluctantly orders Doppio to send Sayakalata and Seko, the sadistic remaining members of his elite guard, after Bacciarati's team. As soon as the team arrives on the Italian mainland, they are ambushed by Sayakalata and Seko. Sayakalata uses his stand, Green Day, to spread a deadly mold around the area. Giorno realizes that it activates and infects people when they descend to a lower altitude. So Mista blows up the boat's fuel tanks, throwing the team upwards onto the shore. Bacciarati sends the mold-affected Narancia back into the turtle to be healed by Giorno as he and Mista begin making their way up into the village to escape Saikalata's deadly mold. As they climb upwards out of Green Day's range, Seko ambushes them with his stand oasis, which allows him to swim through and soften solid ground. Seko's attack threatens to pull the group down and trigger Green Day, so Bacciarati jumps off a ledge and ambushes him, who is surprised that Bacciarati is not affected by the mold as it should attack all living things. Bacciarati's team manages to escape in a car and drive towards Rome, but on the way Giorno notices that Bacciarati has a hole in his wrist. His skin is cold and that he has no pulse. 
Bucciarati reveals that although Giorno brought him back to life, he had already died and he is only still moving due to Gold Experience's ability, and that he has accepted his fate. Arriving in Rome, the group is ambushed by Sayakalata and Seko again, this time from a helicopter which spreads green day's mold over the city. Seko drops down into the ground to attack them once more. Giorno and Mista shoot a building with gold experience infused bullets which sprout roots to grab and keep the helicopter in place. He and Mista then climb the roots to pursue Sayakalata while Bucciarati prepares to deal with Seko. While making light of Seko's poor verbal skills, Bucciarati is suddenly overwhelmed by the punches of Seko, who rebounds his fists from the ground to increase his speed and power. Giorno and Mista climb the building holding Sayakalata's helicopter, but when Mista fires sex pistols inside, they cannot find Sayakalata and instead they and Mista are wounded. Giorno and Pistol No. 5 enter the helicopter but Sayakalata has surgically separated his body into pieces, which are able to stay living thanks to Green Day's mold. Sayakalata attacks Giorno, trying to force him downwards and trigger the mold. Giorno manages to launch one of Mista's bullets into Sayakalata's head and he apparently falls dead, but Giorno suspects that he is faking. Sayakalata sits up and announces that his severed arm is ready to kill Mista. However, the bullet Giorno shot into Sayakalata's head transforms into a beetle which chews through his skull. Giorno uses gold experience to viciously pummel Sayakalata to death and send his body flying into a garbage truck. Underground, Seko calls Sayakalata on his cell phone, but he does not answer. Seko then notices and listens to a voice message from Sayakalata stating that they are invincible and that he loves Seko. As Seko again prepares to attack Bacciarati, the scene is being watched through binoculars from a man in the Colosseum. Because of his stand's superior speed, Seko severely injures Bacciarati, who decides to flee. Seko then receives a final voice message from Sayakalata, who informs him that Bacciarati's group intend to meet someone in the Colosseum who has a plan to beat the boss. The mysterious man is revealed to be Jean-Pierre Polnareff, who has one of the stand arrows but is now missing many of his body parts and is confined to a wheelchair. Bacciarati uses sticky fingers to escape underground towards the Colosseum, but Seko tracks him using his highly sensitive hearing. Seko forces Bacciarati out of the ground by creating a rain of stone spikes, but Bacciarati bursts a nearby car tire to pop Seko's eardrums. Panicking, Seko grabs a nearby boy, who coincidentally happens to be Dapio, intending to use him as a hostage to escape. However, Bacciarati uses sticky fingers to harmlessly punch through Dapio and unzip Seko's neck. Struggling to save himself, Seko stumbles into the garbage truck containing Sayakalata's body as it drives away. Meanwhile, Bacciarati's body starts falling apart from the damage it has sustained, and Dapio prepares to kill him. Rather than kill Bacciarati, Diavolo has Dapio use him to find out who he is planning to meet. He helps Bacciarati across the road to the Colosseum, but stops when he spots Mista and realizes that his team is nearby. Diavolo calls Dapio and tells him that Bacciarati's body is actually dead and that, due to his sight and hearing now failing him, he is only able to sense the souls inside people. Diavolo disguises Dapio's soul as Trisha's to deceive Bacciarati. After they reach the Colosseum, Dapio and Bacciarati encounter Polnareff, who Diavolo recognizes. Years earlier, Diavolo had unearthed six stand arrows in Egypt, keeping one and selling the rest to Inyaba. He then used the power of the stand arrow to build his criminal organization. He was tracked down by Polnareff and the two battled, the victorious Diavolo leaving Polnareff's broken body for dead. Back in the Colosseum, Diavolo takes control of his and Dapio's shared body, abandons Bacciarati, and makes his way towards Polnareff. Though Polnareff has created a method to track King Crimson's erase time by cutting himself and counting the number of blood drops, King Crimson still gains the upper hand, punching through Polnareff. Diavolo recovers the arrow, but not before Polnareff uses it to pierce his own stand, Silver Chariot, transforming it into a new stand which appears as a shadowy figure. The figure takes the stand arrow from Diavolo and causes everyone in Rome to fall asleep. As Bacciarati's team awakens, they awkwardly discover that they've switched bodies with those that were closest in proximity to them, with Giorno swapping with Narancia and Mista with Trish. 
After the initial shock, they find that they can still control their own stands, although they are unaware of who inhabits Bachirati's unconscious body. Meanwhile, Palmeref's soul has transferred into the turtle, Coco Jumbo. He explains that his former stand Silver Chariot holds the arrow and that it has become Chariot Requiem, which causes souls to switch bodies. He tells them that he is unable to control this stand and that their only option to defeat Diavolo is to retrieve the arrow from Chariot Requiem. He also warns them of Dapio, though he is unsure of his relationship to Diavolo. At the Colosseum's entrance, the group sees Diavolo charging towards Chariot Requiem. However, after he summons Sticky Fingers to cut off Chariot Requiem's arm, realize that Bacciarati is inside Diavolo's body. Members of the group attempt to retrieve the arrow but they discover that Chariot Requiem has the ability to turn their stands against them. Bacciarati orders Mista to shoot his still unconscious body, assuming it is possessed by Diavolo. However, shortly afterwards they experience time erasure during which Diavolo uses King Crimson to impale Giorno's body containing Narancia on broken iron bars. Although Giorno is able to heal the wounds on his own body, he is unable to save Narancia who has already died, and his soul re-enters his own body. Because Diavolo is active, Polnareff deduces that he has two personalities and that Dapio's soul must be inside Bacciarati's body while Diavolo's soul is inside someone else's. The group then chase after Chariot Requiem, after catching up to it, Bacciarati trips the stand, which drops the arrow and walks on without it. Polnareff, no longer being a stand user, is able to grab it without being attacked back, though doing so attracts Chariot Requiem's attention. Dapio dies in Bacciarati's bullet-riddled body feeling lonely and abandoned. Meanwhile, Chariot Requiem races towards Palnareff, but when Mista tries to shoot it, his gun suddenly breaks apart. Chariot Requiem retrieves the arrow and walks off, however, its additional ability takes effect, mutating the bodies of organisms nearby. Inspecting Mista's broken gun and determining that Diavolo destroyed it during a race time, Giorno deduces that Diavolo must be hiding within the body of someone in the group and plans to touch each of them with gold experience to detect Diavolo's soul. Mister refuses, fearing Diavolo could be inside Giorno's body, so Bacciarati agrees to go first. As Giorno moves to check Bacciarati, King Crimson suddenly appears from Mister's body and swiftly severs Giorno's arm. When Trish summons Spice Girl in retaliation, King Crimson grabs hold of her stand, using it to control Mista's body. Diavolo concludes that Chariot Requiem is effectively the shadow of one's own soul, cast by a light source it generates behind each of their heads. He destroys the light source behind King Crimson's head, dissipating Chariot Requiem and allowing him to obtain the arrow. Giorno converts the drops of his blood on King Crimson's hand into a colony of ants which chew through the arrow's shaft so the arrowhead falls to the ground. When King Crimson tries to pick it up, Trish uses Spice Girl to knock the arrow back towards the group. King Crimson then ruthlessly punches through Spice Girl, using the force to propel Mista's body, and himself, towards the arrow. Diavolo attempts to grab the arrow with King Crimson, but Bacciarati destroys Chariot Requiem, returning everybody's souls to their respective bodies. However, with his body already dead, Bacciarati's soul begins to ascend to the heavens. Before departing, he thanks Giorno for making him feel alive again when they met and leaves the arrow in his hands. Diavolo contemplates escaping after seeing Giorno with the arrow. But when Trish reveals her father's intention to flee, he has a change of heart, believing he is entitled to be king and that he should have no reason to run away. Giorno pierces gold experience with the arrow, apparently damaging gold experience, Diavolo takes advantage of this and attacks Giorno to reclaim the arrow, shattering gold experience's face. However, Diavolo's attack doesn't harm him, instead, gold experience absorbs the arrow into its body and sheds its skin like a shell revealing its new form as gold experience requiem. After using Epitaph to witness a vision of himself defeating Giorno, Diavolo uses King Crimson to erase time and attack Giorno, however, Gold Experience Requiem uses its power to nullify his attack, rewinding time to the point of King Crimson's activation and with Diavolo confused and unable to fight back, Gold Experience Requiem viciously pummels him. Mortally wounded, Diavolo falls into the river. Trish urges Giorno to look for him but Giorno claims that it won't be necessary. Diavolo attempts to crawl into a tunnel, 
but is fatally stabbed by a homeless man who is under the influence of the drugs that Diavolo sells. When Diavolo awakens, he finds himself on an operating table, unable to move before a woman walks in and announces she will perform an autopsy. When she attempts to saw off his arm, Diavolo dies again of shock and awakens on a street side in the city. As Diavolo begins to realize what is happening, a dog barks at him, startling him and causing him to fall into the street where he is run over and killed by a car. Meanwhile, Giorno explains to Trish and Mista that the power of gold experience Requiem has doomed Diavolo to die over and over for all eternity. In a flashback to before Bacciarati and the others meet Giorno, a florist approaches Bacciarati and asks him to avenge his daughter. She apparently committed suicide, but he believes that she was killed by her boyfriend, a sculptor named Scalippi. On the way to interrogate the sculptor, Mista sees some strange round stones and upon meeting him, Mista realizes Scalippi is a stand user after finding another stone next to him sculpted in the form of Bacciarati at the moment of his death. Mista tries to force the truth from Scalippi, who explains that his stand rolling stones create stones with images of people at the moment of their deaths. Once a person touches their own stone, they are allowed to choose to accept their death. He affirms that after the florist's daughter touched her stone, she realized that she was about to die and committed suicide to allow her organs to be transplanted into her ailing father and save his life. Upon learning this, Mista tries his best to prevent Bacciarati from touching his own stone, almost killing himself in the process. Back in the present, Giorno and the others learn that, despite his body being dead, Palnareff managed to keep his soul attached to the turtle, which Giorno decides to keep the arrow inside for safekeeping. As the battle is over, Giorno is being watched by Mista and Polnareff as he is instated as the new leader of Passion. In 2011, ten years after the events of Golden Wind, Jolin Kujoa's boyfriend, Romeo Jiso, crashes into a pedestrian. Romeo convinces her to help him dispose of the body, but she is eventually arrested for the victim's death. As she prepares for her trial, her attorney gives her various items from her mother and a pendant from her estranged father, Jotaro Kujo, that contains a piece of a broken arrow that pierces her finger. While on remand at Green Dolphin Street Prison aka the Aquarium in Port St. Lucie, Florida, Jolin meets and befriends an inmate named Erms Costello. She discovers she can emit a long, thin thread from her body, which she can use to hear and attack people from a long distance. She uses it to rescue Erms from two corrupt guards. Later, Jolin's attorney talks her into a plea bargain for a reduced sentence, but she ends up getting sentenced to 15 years in prison when it is revealed the victim was still alive at the time before he was disposed of. She then discovers that her attorney was hired by Romeo's family to frame her for the accident, so she uses her new ability to choke the corrupt lawyer on the freeway and force him to crash. In prison, Jolin shares her cell with Gwes, a prisoner with drastic mood swings who has her father's pendant and a strange pet bird. She discovers that the bird is a hollowed-out shell containing a shrunken prison guard and deduces that Gwes also gained powers from the pendant. Gwes shrinks Jolin and forces her to wear a mouse carcass so that she can sneak into the control room to deactivate the prison locks and help them escape. However, the increased distance from Gwes weakens her shrinking ability, causing Jolin to slowly return to her normal size. On her way back, Jolin is attacked by Gwes' vicious stand, Goo Goo Dolls, but she manages to fight back by materializing her own stand. After Gwes reveals that Erm sold her the pendant, Jolin forces her cellmate to free her by viciously pummeling her with her stand, which she names Stone Free. Gwes demonstrates to Jolin how money and power between inmates is manipulated throughout the prison and as Jolin quickly adapts to the system, she comes across a mysterious boy dressed in a baseball uniform, who tells her that she'll be receiving a visitor the next day and to avoid going to the visitation room. When she decides to go anyway, he gives her a bone to protect herself. And she is disgusted to find that the visitor is her father, Jotaro. He reveals that a blind assassin inmate named John Galli A was responsible for the car accident and arranged for her long prison sentence in revenge against him for killing Dio. Jotaro offers to help her escape but she refuses, still bitter at him for being absent most of her life. Before she can leave, the two are suddenly shot at and wounded from the distant men's prison by John Gallier. His stand, Manhattan Transfer, 
allows him to sense air currents and helps direct his sniper bullets. Jolin attempts to confuse John Gallier's stand in the visitation room by triggering the fire sprinkler system until the mysterious boy instructs her to kick out the base of a pillar, which uncovers a secret passageway. Jotaro suggests that they escape, but Jolin decides to try to save the boy from the enemy stand as he has now become the target. She seemingly foils the assassin by using a broken gas pipe to throw off his sense of direction and immobilizes the stand but realizes she's in a dream and manages to wake herself up by cutting her hand on the bone that the boy gave her earlier. She then finds herself, Jotaro, and the room covered in a corrosive slime. Jotaro is awakened by Jolin and he uses his stand, Star Platinum, to free them from the melting room and begins to lead Jolin to a beach where a submarine from the Speedwagon Foundation is waiting for them. However, they are shot at by John Gallier, who disguised himself as a prison guard and the injured Jotaro realizes that he is the target and that the sniper is working with another stand user who put him and Jolin to sleep. The other attacker's stand, named White Snake, converts Jotaro's stand and memories into discs then extracts them from him, and as Jotaro falls into a coma, Jolin finds out how much her father truly cared for her. She then defeats John Galley and leaves Jotaro at the beach to be picked up by the Speedwagon Foundation before returning to the prison in the hope of retrieving the discs and reviving him. Back inside, she contacts the boy, who tells her his name is Emporio and that he was born in the prison, where his inmate mother was killed by Whitesnake. Meanwhile, Whitesnake shoots John Galley with his own gun to make it look like self-termination. Jolin has five years added to her sentence for the attempted prison break and is placed in solitary confinement in the punishment ward. Erms wakes up in the infirmary following a fever she developed after piercing herself on Jolin's pendant to find herself being robbed by the inmate janitor, Thunder McQueen. She discovers that she can produce stickers from the palm of her hand that duplicates whatever they touch and merge the items back together in a destructive manner if the sticker is removed or destroyed. She uses a sticker to attack McQueen and she finds two discs sticking out of his head. She takes one and finds it contains his memories, including one where he meets with White Snake. McQueen attempts to hang himself out of a sense of despair which causes his stand highway to hell to inflict his pain onto Erms, but she uses her stand to save herself and runs into Emporio, who informs her that the disc still inside McQueen contains his stand. Erms unsuccessfully tries to stop McQueen's suicide attempt so she uses a sticker to incapacitate him and eject the stand disc. She plans revenge on Whitesnake for her ordeal as her stand, Kiss, manifests itself and gives McQueen's discs to Emporio for safekeeping while lending the memory one to Jolin to see if there are any clues about Whitesnake and her fathers. Meanwhile, two inmates are consumed by a blob-like monster at the prison farm near the swamp and the prison chief Wakobarako assembles all the inmates and calls for volunteers to search for the escapees. Jolin and Erms volunteer along with an inmate named Atro and two other women. They are forced to wear bracelets that will explode if they stray more than 50 meters away from the lead guard. And Jolin tells Erms she learned from McQueen's memories that White Snake has dozens of stand discs stored within one of the tractor tires on the farm. As they approach the wetlands, Erms notices that there are six inmates when only five volunteered and the guard is suddenly attacked and dragged far away, which causes Atro's bracelet to explode, killing her. Erms is then dragged into the water by an enemy stand made up of multiplying, sentient plankton but Jolin frees her and the stand remains in the water refusing to follow them inland. The two then confront the other three members of the search party to determine who the imposter is and they discover that the two of the search party members were killed and possessed by extensions of their opponent. A plankton colony called Foo Fighters aka FF, who used the victim's remains to disguise itself and explains that it is both a stand user and a stand after Whitesnake granted it intelligence to guard the stand discs for him. Jolin chases him into the nearby barn while Erms attempts to prevent the stand's double from dragging away the guard to trigger their bracelets. Burmese defeats the double by drawing it out of the water and exposing it to the dried up corpse of one of the inmates while in the barn, FF gains the upper hand on Jolin after covering the ground with water, but she uses stone freeze threads to activate the tractor and drive the discs away. FF chases the tractor but falls apart as its body is absorbed by the dirt and Jolin decides to spare the dying entity when she realizes it was protecting the discs for their own sake rather than for white snakes and refines Jotaro's stand disc, 
but not his memory and FF possesses Atro's corpse to join Jolin and Hermes in prison, hiding Jotaro's disc within her body. The farm is later investigated by Whitesnake and its user, Enrico Pucci, the prison's head priest before an inmate thief named Mirishan approaches them seeking parole but instead he inserts two discs into her, planning to use her to get Jotaro's stand disc back. Meanwhile, in the exercise yard, FF slowly gets accustomed to Atro's body and plays a game of catch with Jolin. Mirishan appears and bets $100 that they cannot the catch ball 100 times in a row and when they succeed, he challenges them to catch the ball another 100 times for $1000. Jolin refuses, but Hermes accepts the bet and takes her place. When a guard confiscates the glove from Hermes she is forced to cheat with her stand. Losing the bet. Mirashan's stand, Marilyn Manson, appears to extract the money from Hermes and since she does not have enough, Marilyn removes her liver to pay off the rest of the debt. Jolin then bets that she can catch the ball 1000 times in return for everything that was taken from Hermes. Mirashan re-enters the prison, forcing Jolin and FF to continue to toss the ball while chasing her. The game is again interrupted by the guard who takes the ball, but Jolin retrieves it with her thread and continues the game. Since they never agreed on a specific partner, Jolin has stone free tossed the ball at Mirishan 1000 times and as a result, she wins the bet, saves Hermes, and retrieves the two discs. She uses her winnings from Mirishan's bets to buy time on the phone to call the Speedwagon Foundation and a representative instructs her to deliver Jotaro's stand disc to Savage Garden at the courtyard in 20 minutes. On her way there, Emporio pulls her into the ghost of a music room from the prison's past as his stand, burning down the house, enables him to manifest objects which no longer exist. He introduces her to an amnesiac stand user named Weather Report who wants to help her and while demonstrating his stand's power to control the weather. He spots an inmate named Lang Wrangler following them. Wrangler uses his stand, Jumpin' Jack Flash to manipulate gravity and suspend Jolin in mid-air, making her and anything she touches weightless. He steals Jotaro's stand disc from her but when he retreats, Weather's stand counters his abilities with atmospheric pressure. Weather then touches Jolin to also become weightless and they chase Wrangler into the main factory area to retrieve the disc. Pucci requests access to recent phone recordings to learn more about Jolin's call to the Speedwagon Foundation while in the factory room, she and Weather find themselves in a zero-gravity vacuum being shot at by Wrangler's metal projectiles and in danger of suffocating from a lack of oxygen. With their blood leaking from their bodies. Weather uses his stand and the remaining air to create suits of clouds that allow them to breathe and halt their blood loss for a short time and Jolin figures out that Jumpin' Jack Flash has a limited range in the room and tries to help Weather reach it so he can manipulate the air, but his suit suffers considerable damage from Wrangler's attacks. Wrangler attempts to rupture her protective suit, but Jolin attaches multiple threads to his projectiles, allowing her to pull him into the zero-gravity vacuum area which causes his blood to boil. He destroys her suit by throwing an exploding glass bottle at her, but Weather saves her by giving the rest of his cloud suit. Wrangler is forced to reinstate gravity, but the incoming burst of air pushes him towards Jolin, allowing her to pummel him with stone free. She uses Wrangler's card to request a guard to open the door, but she is greeted by Pucci. Back in 1988, Dio told Pucci that he found a way to reach heaven without dying and wrote the instructions on how to do so in a notebook that Jotaro burned after killing him. So Pucci plans to read the contents of Dio's notebook through Jotaro's memory disc. In the present, Pucci allows Jolin to go to the courtyard to avoid revealing Whitesnake, but she is shot by a guard under his control and drops the disc. A desperate weather tries to help Jolin by making it rain poison dart frogs, which kill the guard who shot Jolin as she protects herself by creating a shelter with her threads and Pucci also managing to evade them. When the deluge stops, Pucci instructs Whitesnake to search the courtyard for Jotaro's stand disc and Jolin's body, but when Whitesnake locates the stand disc, Jolin uses her threads to grab the disc and pass it to Savage Garden, a trained carrier pigeon from the Speedwagon Foundation. Pucci withdraws Whitesnake to prevent Jolin from identifying its user, and some time later Whitesnake meets with Sports Max and asks him to test his abilities on a bone from Dio's body. Jolin and FF discover that Hermes got herself sent to prison so she could track down and kill Sports Max, a notorious gangster who murdered her older sister, Gloria, and after several days of following him, 
Burmese uses her stand to trap Max in a sewer pipe and drown him. While trapped, he activates his stand Limp Biscuit, which has the ability to bring the dead back to life as invisible zombies, and uses his stand on a stuffed bird and alligator to attack Hermes, Jolin, and FF. After FF defeats the alligator, Hermes and Jolin find out that Max became an invisible zombie and escaped the pipe after his body drowned in the sewage. He lures the two into the prison's mausoleum and revives several dead prisoners to get revenge on Hermes for killing him. She allows herself to be attacked and uses Kiss's ability to locate Max, and though he takes a bite out of her head, Hermes completely annihilates him and pass out from her injuries. Jolin uses Max's discs to review his memories before she is detained and taken to the prison's disciplinary wing. FF and Emporio retrieve his memory disc and find out that Whitesnake forced Max to bring one of Dio's bones back to life, while Jolin allowed herself to be taken to the disciplinary wing in order to find the bone, lure Whitesnake's user to her, and ultimately retrieve Jotaro's memory disc. Narciso Anasue, a stand user who was arrested for murdering his unfaithful girlfriend, agrees to help FF rescue Jolin, as he has fallen for her and wants to marry her while revealing his stand, Diver Down, can store itself inside any surface and manipulate it from the inside. To prevent Jolin from finding the bone, Pucci sends four stand users to the disciplinary wing to assassinate her and one of them uses the stand survivor to enrage guard Viviano Westwood causing him to kill his partner and open all of the cells for a free-for-all. Jolin faces off against Westwood while fighting off survivor's influence and figures out that he is a stand user while Westwood's stand, Planet Waves, attracts small meteorites towards him that seriously wound his enemies and disintegrate before they hit him. During their fight, Jolin notices one of the inmates taking Dio's bone and ultimately defeats the Berserk Guard by using his boot to store the force of a meteorite and hit him with it before she finds that only two other inmates are left standing after the brawl in the disciplinary wing. FF arrives in time to fight one of the survivors, an elderly former cult leader named Kenzu who reveals his stand, Dragon's Dream, which allows him to use Feng Shui to find the luckiest angles for his attacks and cause his opponent to suffer great misfortune. When Kenzu forces FF to trigger the stand's effect, a piece of metal from a malfunctioning ceiling fan detaches itself and slices off the top part of their head. FF survives and manages to land a few shots on Kenzu, but when they attempt to get water and heal themselves, they trigger Dragon's Dream once more and become trapped in an active electric chair. Before the chair activates, FF uses Kenzu's sweat to create a reflection of his stand, tricking him into standing in an unlucky area and allowing them to electrocute him as well. Jolin realizes that both parties survived the electrocution and jumps down to save FF only for Kenzu attempts to finish her until Anasue uses Diver Down to disassemble his legs and rearrange them into springs, rendering him unable to fight. The three confront the prisoner who had Dio's bone, only to find that he and the rest of the inmates are turning into plants when exposed to sunlight. Jolin, who has also begun changing, notices that the bone has transformed into a green baby, which the group seizes. While leaving, Anasue encounters Gucho, the stand user of Survivor and converts his body into a trap to prevent the remaining stand user, D&G, from following them. D&G's stand, Yo-Yo Ma, suddenly appears near the group and consumes the green baby causing FF to stay behind to eliminate D&G while Jolin, Anasue, and the serval Yo-Yo Ma escape into the wetlands. However, FF's lower jaw begins to dissolve as they realize he has already begun its attack. In the wetlands, Jolin, Anasue, and Yo-Yo Ma steal one of the guard's boats to approach the main prison. After Jolin's tongue is suddenly dissolved by mosquitoes carrying Yo-Yo Ma's acidic spit, she attempts to warn Anasue of the stand's power. Anasue discovers the stand's intent and uses Diver Down to connect Yo-Yo Ma's brain to a frog's brain, neutralizing the stand. Meanwhile, as FF attempts to kill D&G, they encounter Pucci and discover that he is Whitesnake's user, and when Pucci attempts to steal their memories, FF sacrifices Atro's body to kill D&G, destroying Yo-Yo Ma in the process. They then attempt to recover with a faucet to inform Jolin of Pucci's identity, but Whitesnake forces the water to boil, disintegrating them. Meanwhile, Jolin and Anasue attempt to retrieve the green baby, but find themselves shrinking whenever they get close to it as a result of the infant stand, green, green grass of home. Anasue traps the stand in a bottle, but becomes trapped underneath the bottle's weight as it threatens to crush him, 
until the baby and its stand stop attacking the two when it notices the star-shaped birthmark on Jolin's shoulder, but Anasue senses it has dark intentions and plans to kill it. Before Poochie can take FF's stand disc and determine Jolin's whereabouts, he discovers that FF was communicating to Weather Report using a guard's transceiver, and Weather uses his stand to create heavy rain above the two, restoring FF and allowing them to escape. After seemingly reuniting with Weather, the two meet up with Jolin and Anasue revealing that Pucci is White Snake's user and Anasue announces his intent to kill the green baby, but the Weather with them is revealed to be a disguised White Snake and fatally wounds him and F. Pucci arrives and battles Jolin, who prevents him from escaping with a pair of handcuffs but when she begins to overpower him, Pucci tosses Jotaro's memory disc into the dying Anasue, forcing her to abandon the fight. After reciting 14 phrases and offering his own bone, Pucci fuses with the green baby and the prisoner's souls contained within it. Meanwhile, using the last of their strength, FF heals Anasui's wounds and saves Jotaro's memory disc before saying goodbye to Jolin and passing on. Having fused with the green baby, Pucci leaves Green Dolphin Street Prison to enact the next part of Dio's plan to attain heaven, and after viewing her father's memory disc and discovering Pucci's plans, Jolin resolves to escape the prison and stop him. As she and Emporio contemplate how to break out, they are confronted by the prison's head guard, Mio Mio, who uses her stand jailhouse lock to make Jolin suffer from short-term memory loss that limits her to only remembering three things at a time. Mio Mio attempts to prevent her from retaining her memories, but she resolves to meet Emporio, who has also been affected by jailhouse lock. Jolin reaches Emporio's room, where he remembers that he intended to print an image of the head guard's face. Mio Mio appears behind them, having followed Jolin, and shoots both Emporio and his computer. Jolin chases down Mio Mio, but the head guard summons multiple officers to prevent Jolin from remembering her. Until Emporio uses stone free string to print out a binary image of Mio Mio, allowing Jolin to identify her as the enemy and finally defeat her. Holding Mio Mio hostage, the two meet Hermes in the medical ward, who escapes the prison with them. Meanwhile, Pucci begins to lose control of his stand, which shows preliminary signs of a new ability, as he heads toward his final destination, the Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral. After learning of Jolin, Hermes, and Emporio's jailbreak, Anasue and Weather Report escape from Green Dolphin as well to join them in tracking down Pucci, who meets a drug addict and two troubled youths at a hospital who appear to be stand users shortly after hearing about Jolin's escape. Near Orlando, Anasue and Weather hitch a ride from an old man to get to Pucci faster and on board the truck, Anasue suddenly sees various fictional characters such as Pinocchio, Snow White, and the Seven Dwarves come to life and hear that many more are appearing over the radio. Anasue finds that his and the truck driver's souls have been separated from their bodies because they like these fairy tales growing up but Weather is not affected as his amnesia prevents him from recognizing any of the characters. After killing Pinocchio, Anasue sees the old man transform into the big bad wolf and beheads him and when the wolf claims his story has ended, Anasue is confused before seeing his body run off with Weather. Anasui's soul attempts to catch up to Weather and finds that more people are being separated from their bodies by the fictional characters as a result of an enemy stand named Bohemian Rhapsody. After seeing a store owner become the prince who saves Snow White, he realizes that everyone is being forced to live out the character's stories before he then becomes the wolf from the wolf and the seven young goats and is chased by the mother goat wielding scissors. Weather is separated from his body by Van Gogh's self-portrait who attempts to make him shoot himself in the head twice just as the real one did, and when Weather attempts to track the stand user, he finds that he has already left Florida on a plane. The stand user is revealed to be the drug addict Pucci met named Ungalo, who is one of Dio's illegitimate sons alongside the two recruited by Pucci to stop Jolin and her allies. Weather ultimately defeats the stand by using Van Gogh's artistic talent to create a new character that returns the rest of the characters back to their worlds and brings everyone else back to reality, leaving Ungalo devastated. Meanwhile, Jolin stops by a remorseful Romeo's house and convinces him to lend her money in his personal helicopter. She, Hermes, and Emporio are forced to crash their helicopter as they are attacked by Dio's next child, Rikiel, who is shown to have suffered panic attacks until Pucci exposed his stand, Sky High, which gives him the ability to control rods that extract body heat and attack his foes internally. 
Joel encounters his ability by lighting herself on fire. Forcing Rikyo to do the same so he could target Jolin's brain stem, however, she is still able to track him thanks to his Joestar lineage and beats him down. Rikyo then uses his stand to remove his body's ability to feel pain to force Jolin to choose between killing him or letting him kill her, but she manages to avoid both options as Rikyo putting his hand on her neck prevented her heat from being removed. Rikyo believes Pucci will use Jolin's determination and luck to his advantage and reveals that Weather is Pucci's younger brother, before Ramiz knocks him out. Jolin and her team locate Pucci and the last of Dio's sons, Donatello Versus, at the Orlando Hospital, and she instructs Emporio to contact the Speedwagon Foundation and deliver Jotaro's memory disc to them while she and Ramiz go inside to fight Pucci. Versus awakens his stand, Underworld, which creates a large hole in their room that he and Pucci hide in. When Jolin goes inside the hole to investigate, she suddenly finds herself inside a plane and signals Hermes to pull her back, but the latter ends up falling in with her after being deceived by a memory of Sportsmax, and they find out that they are in a plane that crashed in 2005 and have minutes before the accident is recreated. From his rough upbringing and his encounter with Pucci, Versus discovers that his stand ability is to excavate memories and events of people from the earth. During the fight, he grows increasingly agitated at Pucci for belittling him and secretly steals Weather's memory disc from the priest. Jolin attempts to escape through the plane's emergency exit, but Versus gets her trapped in the memory of a jet fighter who also crashed in the area, but she gets in contact with Emporio, who uses his computer to relay to them the events that happened, and instructs Jolin to crash the jet into the plane and then for her and Hermes to find the two seats of the only passengers that survived the crash. When they arrive there, Versus brings down some children from the hospital to force them to choose between saving themselves or the kids, but they manage to save everyone by hiding themselves and the children inside the bodies of the replicants of the surviving passengers using their respective stand abilities. The cornered Versus uses his stand to return Weather's memories to him, causing rainbows to suddenly appear and after regaining his memories, Weather develops a more aggressive and sinister attitude as he becomes focused on finding Pucci. Pucci and Versus escape the hospital as Weather's evolved stand, Heavy Weather, begins to affect the entire city and anyone exposed to the rainbows in the area eventually transforms into a snail. Jolin and Hermes decide to track Versus, who is attempting to find Emporio to get Jotaro's memory disc and learn the secrets to obtaining heaven. As Versus uses Jolin's memory to locate Emporio and knock him out, she and Hermes partially transform after touching the snails, and Jolin prevents Versus from escaping with her father's disc by infecting both him and Emporio, and as they hijack a car to find Weather, they discover that many of the snails are being eaten by beetles. Weather was Pucci's fraternal twin brother, Domenico, who was switched at birth in 1972 by a mother who lost her child and was raised as West Blue Marine. When Pucci decided to pursue priesthood at the age of 15, he meets Dio one night in the church, who cures his disfigured foot and gives him a stand arrow. Shortly later, Wessa's dying mother came to church and confessed to Pucci that she swapped her deceased child with his twin, and after discovering his brother was alive, Pucci learned that his younger sister, Perla, was dating Wes. Unable to tell her of their incestuous relationship due to the seal of confession, Pucci hires a PI group to force them to break up, however, the group was affiliated with the Ku Klux Klan and decided to beat and lynch Wes after learning his adopted mother's husband was African American. Unable to hear his faint heartbeat, Perla assumes he died and ended her life and her death sent Pucci into despair and caused the arrow to pierce him, resulting in both twins developing their stands. Weather's rage at Pucci's actions and his inability to kill himself causes his stand to go haywire and turns several of the townsfolk into snails forcing Pucci to confront him and uses White Snake to remove his memories before sending him to prison. The tragic events inspired Pucci to seek out Dio and eventually become his disciple. Weather encourages Anasue to kill him after he gets revenge on Pucci as he is unable to control heavy weather but they are suddenly ambushed by the priest who cuts off Weather's legs and transforms Anasue with the rainbows. Pucci removed his sight to make him immune to heavy Weather's ability after remembering that blind people were unaffected back when his stand awakened, and Weather uses Pucci's blindness to his advantage by freezing his blood to form spikes and using the wind and frozen blood to bring him closer. He gains the upper hand, but before he could finish Pucci off, he is suddenly interrupted by the arrival of Jolin and her allies. 
This brief distraction allows Pucci to murder Weather as well as Versus in the ensuing chaos before using his stand to escape, and as Jolin and her friends mourn Weather, they find his stand's disc on his corpse and take it with them. A day after Weather's death, Jolin sends Jotaro's memory disc to the Speedwagon Foundation to help her father recover as her group drives towards the Kennedy Space Center, but when they approach Cape Canaveral, they get pulled back as the gravity is now directed sideways due to Pucci stand fully fusing with the green baby to become Seamoon. Burmese falls behind after getting knocked by some debris while Jolin, Emporio, and Anisway climb their way toward the space center and Pucci's evolved stand confronts Jolin and begins to turn her inside out by reversing the gravitational pull on her body. Jolin tricks Seamoon into striking her again to return her body to normal, and using Anisway as a weight, she wraps her threads around the stand's neck to choke it out and leave it vulnerable. Before she can capitalize on it, Pucci arrives and causes another shift in gravity as he is the center of the phenomenon and instructs Seamoon to attack her heart and reverse the blood flow to her brain, seemingly killing her. However, Emporio receives a text from Jotaro informing him that he's nearby and that Jolin is still alive. And with Pucci being aware of her survival as well, Anisue decides to pursue him to protect Jolin. Pucci attempts to find Jolin to finish her off while fighting Anisue along the way and he eventually locates her and finds that she discovered a way to prevent her body from being turned inside out by making her threads into Mobius strips every time Seamoon attacks her. After weakening her further, Pucci grabs a security officer's gun to shoot her, but she is rescued by the arrival of Jotaro and Hermes, who used a harpoon from the Speedwagon Foundation to catch up to them. Pucci begins floating in a door frame as he realizes he doesn't need to wait 36 hours for the new moon as long as he can stimulate the gravity requirements to evolve his stand further. Jotaro uses Star Platinum's ability to stop time to throw the harpoon at him, but Pucci turns his eyes at the last second in the stop time to avoid a fatal blow and lands in the space shuttle to get to the optimal position. He then successfully evolves his stand to its final form, made in heaven. And after a blinding light from the transformation, Jolin and her allies wake up 200 meters away from the shuttle and are unable to detect where Pucci is. When man-made objects and nature begin moving at high speeds, they realize made in heaven can accelerate time and Pucci begins approaching them as a blur as he is the only one able to keep up with the accelerated. Jotaro finds out his ability to stop time has been reduced as a result. And as they move to a nearby rooftop, they struggle to find a way to counter Pucci's new ability. Before Pucci can finish them off, Emporio uses his ghost room gun and Hermes sticker to fly them away. Anisue instructs him to land them in the ocean to track Pucci better. Where he plans to have made in heaven attack Diver down first so Jotaro can stop time and finish the priest off. They begin to notice the sky moving faster as time accelerates even further and when Anisue is impaled, Jotaro stops time, but finds that Pucci used stone free to murder Anisue and had thrown knives at Jolin just as Dio did to him before, forcing him to save his daughter instead. Pucci kills Jotaro and Hermes and wounds Jolin, leaving Emporio the only one left against him. Jolin saves him by tying him to a dolphin with her threads and sacrifices herself to give him more time to escape and Emporio watches in horror as time accelerates to the point that it resets the entire universe, until he suddenly finds himself naked and back in Green Dolphin Street Prison. Emporio finds that he is back at the day when he met Jolin, only to find imitations of her and Jotaro in the visiting center. Pucci explains that they are in a parallel universe where all survivors from the previous universe have subconscious precognition of their fates, which he and Dio believe to be a state of heaven, and that everyone who died in the previous universe will not return. He brought them back to that day so he could tie up loose ends by killing Emporio and tracks him to his ghost room to finish him off. However, Emporio tricks the priest into inserting weather stand disc, which was given to him by Jolin before she died, into his head. Pucci accelerates time again, but Emporio uses Weather's stand to fill the room with pure oxygen, causing Pucci to suffer oxygen toxicity at a hastened rate. Emporio declares that fate will follow the path of justice, and Weather's stand pummels Pucci to death. As a result, the universe resets once more, and Emporio finds himself at a gas station. He meets a hitchhiker named Eldis and a couple named Irene and Anakis, who appear to be reincarnations of Hermes, Jolin, and Anisway, respectively. 
Irene offers to take Emporio and the hitchhiker with them as they travel to meet Irene's father. Upon seeing Irene's star-shaped birthmark, Emporio tearfully introduces himself to her and while driving, they also pick up another hitchhiker who resembles Weather Report. Thank you for watching, if you enjoyed this video, then consider dropping a like as well as subscribe for more content every week, and comment to let me know which show would you like me to recap. If you want to support me and my channel, check out my Ko-Fi page for more content and my merch store, Anime Bonfire for shirts and hoodies, and I will see you guys in the next video.